Okay. All right, everybody, welcome to the April 28th. Wait, I'm sorry, this is May, the May 26th uh, Planning Commission meeting. We'll call to order at 5 31. Does anybody have any uh, amendments or changes to the agenda or anything that they would like to add? No. Can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, all in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Okay. So the agenda is approved, uh, approved as written. Um, next order of business is the April 28th uh, minutes. Does everybody have a moment to review the minutes? Are there any noted changes or discrepancies? No. no. All right. Can I get a motion to adopt as uh, presented? So moved. Second. Second. All, right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Unanimously adopted. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda is a public comment on non hearing related planning commission matters. I do have a speaker signed up. Um, Andrea Sopper? Yes. Okay. Uh, you have three minutes. Okay. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm here tonight just to ask a couple questions about the uh, townhouse development, which I live across the street from. And my understanding is that there's a 35 foot height restriction. So I was a little surprised to see um, what looks just like a protrusion in the middle of two buildings. Um, there was one yesterday, there's two today. Um, I asked around and I was told that, that they were uh, stair access to rooftop desks. And I'm here because after speaking to a couple of town council members, one current and one former, they were also surprised uh, to see my photo. They don't remember a variance being given. And one even said to me, I was wondering how they would get up there. So my questions are, why were these staircase access, which look they look like small outhouses in the middle of the building? I'm sure they're going to look nice when they're done, but at the moment they're, you know, very visible. Uh, why were these not in any drawings or renderings? Did you all grant a variance for these? And is this a height violation? I know you can't answer all my questions tonight, but I did want to come and and ask you that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the best way to get some answers for that is to visit the planning and zoning office. Well, I called there today. I did not, I did not get a return call. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll make sure that somebody reaches back out to you. Um, let's see. Do you have a phone number that you could add to this? It's Andrea. Do you have a phone number that I could put on the sign-up sheet so that I could get your information? Oh, um, sure. You want to just add it to yeah. Okay. Well, somebody, somebody will help me out with that. We'll make sure that that gets to the right folks. Thank you. Anybody else uh, wishing to comment on non hearing related matters? No. no. <clears throat> Up next is. Uh, Excuse me. I, I, yes, sir. Uh, we have a email uh, comment and I'm going to read it into the record sure. for the uh, planning commission members. Uh, this is an email uh, that was sent by Joyce Reimer. Um, I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I have it on. Oh, oh, How about now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, email from um, resident Joyce Reimer. Um, she uh, just identifies herself as a homeowner at 204 Bancroft Avenue. Um, and her comments um, that she would like to uh, share with the planning commissioner as follows. I was encouraged by the language of the proposed amendments to zoning regulations for planned unit developments because they seem to lay the groundwork for increasing the inventory of much needed middle income and workforce housing in this community. I would, however, make a couple of recommendations. Per number three, under statement of intent, I would recommend that local businesses be able to weigh in on what income level should be 
uh, to assure that they will uh, meet business workforce needs. Also, despite my support for the other types of zoning changes being proposed, I would ask whether there is any connection between these proposed zoning changes and any arrangements being made with a specific developer. If that is the case, in the interest of transparency, I believe that should be made public. I would not like to see the public finding themselves over a barrel, so to speak, in which they must approve all plans for a particular development or face loss of the entire project if they feel modifications should be made. I would also like to see planning committee meetings uh, broadcast since many of the decisions that determine town action occur in these meetings. Okay, thank you very much. All right. uh, that concludes public comment. Next on the agenda is discussion regarding potential text amendments to Article 29, the planned unit development um, for the residential district. Uh, we gave some feedback after or during the presentation, and it looks like there's been some uh, amended copy uh, presented to us for review. Correct. Um, Mr. Shaw, can you help provide some color on uh, the communication that we got from the Berkeley group? Well, uh, I believe we have um, Wait, available, available Kelly Day. No, excuse me, right? Different than what I got in my email tonight? Is it different than what I got? Learning on the week? Before. That's, that's Is this the same I received on Monday? It should be. Okay, okay. I got confused with it. Okay. And, uh, it's my understanding what you received uh, has been a uh, change or amended uh, just for that time. Perfect. That, that's dated May 11th, is what we received on Monday. Uh, that's correct. The, if I, is is Ms. Davis there? It's my understanding that representative of the birthday group actually would be here by Zoom. Uh, there she is right there. Hi, yes, okay. I'm here. So, um, and I, I also have Caroline Banter with me yes. as well. All right. Hold on for a second. Well, I don't know if she can hear us, obviously. Yeah. Hi, I can hear you all. That'll do it. Can you it close enough to it? Yeah, yeah it's, it's increasing. Oh, I see. Going up. <clears throat> Great, let's try this again. Can you say something so see if we can hear you now? Can you hear us now? Yes. Yes. We Thank you. Thank you. So I don't have a presentation for you tonight. Um, however, we're here to answer any questions that you have. We provided a revised draft based off your comments during the May 3rd meeting. And then we also provide provided an, a final uh, revision summary document as well that you should have before you. Um, we're happy to answer any questions or take any additional comments that you would have. I'd just like to ask that you kind of step through the uh, changes just briefly so that we can kind of um, review the document. And, uh, sure, I, I can share my screen. I don't know. Are you all able to see a shared screen or should I just plan to? Um, step through it one by one if you all have that uh, review. We should be able to share the screen. Okay. Uh, first of all, for the record, my name is Kelly Davis and I'm the planning director for the Berkeley Group. I was unable to attend the earlier meeting in May as I was in another meeting that evening, but I'm happy to be here before you tonight. And you all should have already met Caroline as she presented and was there with you during that previous meeting. So thank you for having us tonight. Can you all see that screen now? Yes. Great. <clears throat> you should have a document. Yeah. Yeah, I did. So some of the um, the topics that were discussed were just questions, and so there are uh, several items in here that perhaps no action was ta was taken. Um, our understanding was that those items were addressed. Um, verbally during the meeting, and so there are some some not applicables here. Uh, the first section that we uh, amended, and Caroline, maybe on your side you can um, have the actual ordinance up. I can only have one document up at a time here, but if we need to share screens or look at some specific language, I'll have Caroline can set that up for us. Does that work for you, Caroline? 
Yes, that works. Okay. So um, there were some questions about the pre-application and approval and the change here was to clarify uh, that the applicant should bring a sketch plat to the pre-application meeting there in section 29-3.1A. Caroline, anything else to add on that item? Sure, I just wanted to clarify that it is an existing ordinance requirement to have a pre-application meeting. Um, so town staff would be able to enforce this, not just for a PUD application, um, but for any rezoning application. Um, and then requiring a preliminary sketch also allows town staff to be able to um, address concerns and answer any questions um, upfront before an application is even submitted. Thank you. Uh, the next question was regarding application requir requirements with regard to environmental analysis. We added some uh, reference to environmental requirements outlined in Article 19, um, Article 21, and Article 22. This yielded a new uh, item under that section 29-4. And Caroline, do you want to note anything on that item? Nothing to add there, but you all should have that in front of you. Mr. Chairman, would you like us to have comments or questions on line by line or just a summary? Uh, just a summary, just to kind of recap for everything that we had discussed previously so that we can sure. have a, a good way to, to move forward. So I don't think that there's, um, it's necessary to rehash. I just want to refresh, really. Sure. We can take a look at the matters that we had commented on and the questions that we had so we can make sure that everybody's clear and uh, just kind of recap everything. So we, when we discussed this, um, some of the discussion was before or after. Like there was a timing issue to this one. Did we come to it? So it seems like we're on the before stage with this one now. Is that where we came to a conclusion, I, I don't remember. But I know we had a lot of discussion about where the, where this fit in the timing. Right. Will staring at me. Did I, did I, am I misremembering? No, I just don't understand so, what you're talking about. So that, well, that, that happened a lot. Yeah, yeah. So right. Specifically for that environmental, it's under the application requirement. Got it. Okay. So then that that implicitly times it at submitting. Okay. That, right. That's what I wanted anyway. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. And now I understand. <laughs> Uh, the next question was regarding by right uses versus CUP and what types of uses would be permitted for each. We did make some changes to the list of permitted and um, and special or conditional use permit uses after both looking at your existing definitions and then some of the comments that you had. Um, Caroline, might this be an opportunity for you to share screen and kind of walk through that way, all of these permitted use changes? Would that be better than this? That would likely be best. I can share my screen. All right, are you all able to see the ordinance on my screen? Yes. I can see it. Okay. Um, so there was some, um, there was a note during the April meeting um, that some of the uses permitted by right, um, those uses did not match uses listed in the definitions section of the ordinance in Article 20. Um, so first there's a clarification made that any use here um, corresponds to the uses that are defined in the definition section. Um, and then as you can see, there are some minor changes just so the uses in the definition section match what is permitted by right or with a CUP here. Um, and there's no confusion about that um, and that those things are one and the same. Um, there was some discussion last time about a neighborhood convenience store being permitted as a by right use, um, especially for a larger planned unit development. So that change has been made. It is now um, considered to be permitted by right um, as opposed to a conditional use permit. Um, there was also some conversation last time about different recreational facilities um, that may be larger in nature and may not be appropriate for a PUD. Um, so skating rinks, more um, spectator recreational uses, and that use has been taken out 
Um, it has been replaced with a fitness center or a gym. Um, so thinking about how a gym or a fitness club could be much more compatible with a residential and a recreational PUD um, rather than a larger spectator sport facility. Um, so that has been added as a conditional use permit, whereas the previous use has been taken out. And then finally, the there was a question about temporary family health care structures. Um, the state code reference has been added there just to clarify that the reason these are being permitted by right is because um, it is provided for that in the Virginia state code. And that section is referenced there in case there are any questions um, or if that needs to be cross-referenced at any point in time during the review. We hear a little bit of discussion on your side. Would you like us to continue or is there? Just trying to help him find the, okay. the documentation so, for. Um, so a temporary family health care structure is a gym? No, 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 no. Yeah. moving on. So that's, yeah. she made the code reference here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that so they explicitly referenced the state code for temporary health care. We've moved on, but this is a separate next item. Yeah, well, then let's back up just a smidge. If we mm -hmm. could. You said you um, put in gym instead of like skating rink or something to that effect. And I see outdoor rink. Okay, so the fitness center gym is in the um, CUP section, CUP not section. the buy right section. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. Missed that part of it, apparently. Okay, never mind. I'm good. Thanks. Did, did I hear you say that that um, all of the descriptions in both the permitted and conditional use areas um, are now defined, are, are now matched definitions and they are existing zoning codes? Are, yes, that's okay. correct. Um, a commissioner pointed out I apologize, I can't remember um, who it was, but during the last meeting, it was brought up that some of the uses had some slightly different verbiage than what was in the definition section. Um, so we re-reviewed that and made sure to correct any discrepancies. Okay, well, good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on the permitted uses? I'd like clarification on it, I, I understand what a gym is, like particularly if you're talking about like a small commercial gym, but what is something like a recreation center that has a whole bunch of different sort of uses in them um, or a community center that doesn't, that has a bunch of gathering uses in them, but doesn't relate to, you know, recreation or fitness. How, how, how would either one of those fit into any of these or don't they? Mm -hmm. So my understanding based on the current ordinance is that something like a community center would fall, depending on who is operating it, whether it would be the town or a private um, operation, that would fall under either public facilities, which are permitted by right, or civic, social, or fraternal facilities, which would be more private in nature and would be permitted with a conditional use permit. Um, so either of those things would be permissible in a PUD based on what's proposed here. Um, it's just that if it were a public facility, it would be a by right use, whereas a more private um, facility that might re require membership to some degree would be permitted through a CUP. Does that answer your question? So for example, you're saying like a YMCA has a membership base, so they would need a conditional use permit in that case. That's correct. And based on the definition under definition section, my understanding is that a YMCA could also fall under the definition of a fitness center or a gym. Um, either way, it would be a conditional use permit, though. Yes. So I guess I'm still struggling with how you deal with multi use facilities that have like it may have one or more of these components in them, but it's actually a mixed use entity that's accomplishing several you know, sort of public serving functions in one room. Um, as, you know, as, as often seen in other communities, we sort of have these things that are sort of, you know, catch-alls um, and they serve a number of functions. So how do, how do we supposed to view those in terms of 
is the presence of any one of those uses um if it shows up in the conditional use turn the whole venture into conditional use or do you only have to uh, you know go through the hoops for that one usage and the rest of the operation is by right some communities handle that in different ways and so the zoning administrator would work with an applicant to determine which use would be most appropriate in different scenarios um, some communities would decide what's the what's the primary use on the property and you might be able to have or within the building and then you might have the others as accessory and that's okay other times depending on the extent anticipated extent of impacts or if there truly is no primary use on the property then you might just need to come in for a cup and um and go at it that that route okay and then, and then back it's, to your it's really a case-by-case -case basis i guess is what i'm saying um, government owned or government run so is, is there a distinction between whether the public owns the the land, the building, or operates it. Like, you know, what do you do when that becomes which which use are you looking at? I guess in terms of you're saying, like, you know, if the public if the public owns and operates, they get that part. That's really cut and dry. But um, when it, you know, often have these facilities which are private facilities, but they have government functions going on in them. Um, you know, because they're you know, sort of grant operations or things that sort of are funded by the public and are staffed by the public, but the building's not the public's. So how do you deal with the hybrid? You have to go back to your specific definitions. And again, in some of those cases, it would it would need to be a zoning administrator determination or a look at all of your definitions. And that's something that we do with communities as a separate project project from this, but do your definitions align with the current use and you know, modern functions like you're talking about where you might have multiple uses in one building. Um, that wasn't really part of what this effort was. And I'm not as familiar with your specific definitions to be able to to hone in and give a, a strong answer to that question. But if the zoning administrator or somebody that is acting in that function wants to comment on this specific ordinance, um, would be open to that as well. And I am pulling up your definitions as well. Can you can you clear? I got confused in a long line. You said I I only must have caught a piece of it where you said you reviewed our definitions. We oh. have not. I mean, other than for the particular definitions that we with these uses, we have not done. We were not. Our project was not to perform a comprehensive review of your of Colonial Beach's zoning ordinance definitions. Uh, we do that for other localities as part of other efforts um, where we provide recommendations on definitions to address some of the comments that you're you're in questions that you're asking about. I, 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 okay, awesome, because I think we're with all of that, I, I think it's a great question, but I think it falls back to the case by case thing where if we have a situation like that. We're going to have to look at it with the zoning office and see where it lands and then go from there. Yeah, yeah sorry. My, my questions were just based on that. I thought they actually did review, ah, the review okay. when they mentioned the definition part. I thought they'd done more scope than they'd done. Gotcha. And Mr. Shaw, do you have any you know suggestions on how we should think about that? Uh, the only comment that is relative to what the this conversation we've had thus far about this, as far as principal and accessory uses, it's a determination traditionally based upon uh, making an assessment of what constitutes the principal use and then the other accessory uses be accessory to that principal use. And the principal use historically, traditionally is looked in uh, one or two ways or more than uh, one or two ways and looked in, in conjunction with each other. How frequently is that use? Uh, how many days of the year? How many times that that, that use occurs? Well, that may be more than others, therefore it would be potentially a principal use, or the square footage dedicated to a particular use may be more than another. So in, the, in those two circumstances, that is a, uh, a basis under which uh, our determination is made. 
I don't know if that's helpful or not, but it just gives you some insight about what the process has been my experience anyway, of a type of determination. Mm -hmm. And you just to add this, the, the definitions that you see here are uh, specifically um, enumerated and identified in Article 20, the definitions. The reason that these definitions show up in, in the list of uh, enumerated uses, either for uh, uses by right or conditional uses, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think they were extracted from language that's already present in uh, reference to two zoning districts that historically have been associated with the approval of the PUD, a planned unit development. The language that's currently in the ordinance makes reference to R2A, R4 uses. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that the staff of, uh, of the record group took those and then uh, applied them um, pretty much you know, verbatim uh, to what's here, but just extracted those out from the, the, the identified uh, zoning district that I, that I just referred to. But what's going on now is that the process is not to refer to those those two zoning districts. They took they mean never whereby let's incorporate that all into the PUD the put R as it relates even to a use as well they be by right a conditional rather than have it separated out that way that I just alluded to. So uh, another point here that there's been some conversation about, and I, I, I may, I just uh, would like to comment on this. In neighborhood convenience stores and convenience stores, uh, they're two separate things, that, uh, and they're defined in the way that there is a distinction between the two. The question now arises, do, uh, is it something to include a convenience store as opposed to neighborhood convenience store, have both of those? Because a neighborhood convenience store is, is uh, limited to only 2,000, less than 2,000 square feet. If that's the case, and the developer says, well, gee, we'd like to attract a Wawa or sheets or something like that, that's not going to work because most of those stores have an excess of 2,800 square feet at the, at the low end, all the way up to 4,500 square feet. So if you only pick the, the neighborhood convenience store, and that is something ultimately it may not be um, the interest of the developer or for um, uh, that matter, the, the town, uh, and leaving one of those out, you, for all intents and purposes, are, are you know, limiting that which is uh, the, the size uh, and the square footage if you only uh, choose the or that and just giving you that example. And there's some definitions in here as well that seem to be redundant. Um, outdoor recreational areas and parks and playgrounds, but there are distinctions between that and how they're defined in the in the definition section of the uh, of the zoning ordinance. So uh, at, at face value, you can look at that so well, it looks like the same thing we're talking about here. Uh, it's not. Uh, there are some distinctions between the two. There's also the, the, the case of the tourist home and a bed and breakfast. Um, a lot of times those are considered to be synonymous uh, uses, but there is a distinction between those two as well. So just FYI. If I may, later Thank you, on, John. If I may, oh, sorry. Consideration um, by right uses and conditional uses, all of it, but particularly bear in mind with respect to by right uses that all of this must be um, subject to uh, the development plan. Um, Correct. So sure. it, it's not just as, as straightforward as often is the case for the by right use in zoning districts. <clears throat> So just for my own clarification, so what you're saying is even though it's a by right use, um, when they submit the plan, it would need to be approved prior to being able to move forward with it. The general development plan itself is a part of the application process and has to be approved as well. Got it. So, so it's not like they can just plop whatever they want in there because it's in the by right section. It still needs to be approved. Okay. Exactly. And, and, yeah. it, and the opposite of that is very often true in other zoning districts, you know, with a by right use, as long as you meet setbacks and other things, you have the right. But here it there's this other contingency that also um is 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 um I don't want to say constraining but but governing the development. Okay, thank you. 
I also had the opportunity to bring up the definitions with regard to public facilities per the question earlier. Uh, and that definition is any improvement and the associated land area, which is owned and or controlled by the town council of Colonial Beach. So that goes back to that question that it could be owned or it could be controlled as that as an or and and or um, definition. The definition includes more than that, but just wanted to follow up on that as well. Okay. <clears throat> We're, uh, well, uh, well, I, I had a question on definitions. Um, in the section um, on um, the statement of intent, uh, we have an item number three. It says provide affordable housing opportunities for residents at a variety of income levels. And that seems very vague to me. So I was wondering if we could uh, put that in there in conformity with Westmoreland County's definition of affordable housing. And uh, it's a real simple phrase of uh, ranging um, uh, the the income levels from 60 to 120 percent of the area median income for Westmoreland County. And I say that because that income level is changed uh, annually by HUD. And so as it changes, this language would uh, follow those changes. Is that a possibility? Yeah, I think having a nexus to a standard makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I had a question about the, the same line as well. I didn't understand what it meant by a variety of income levels, like variety sort of seemed oddly vague. Um, and it also doesn't seem to indicate how many, and like there's no like per acre or like one out of a hundred or there's, there's like no metric. It just does provide. Like, well, and, yeah, you, and so, it should, so that, it, it no, it, it, that it would be not. considered a proffer and uh, those are voluntary. So we can't impose a voluntary proffer in the language of the ordinance. And this section is the intent, merely a statement yes. of the intent. So you don't, it would not be um, appropriate really to provide um, specific requirements here in this section anyway. Okay. So we would have to look at defining affordable housing in our definition section of the code separate from this to make that a reference with um, that well, quantification. Yeah, uh, and so uh, uh, looking at um, our comprehensive plan, it sort of outlines the uh, guidelines for the range already in there, but that is a time sensitive document. And so, you know, as the income levels change, um, this kind of language of just following the percentage would follow those changes. Right. And that's why. Well, we need to put that not in the intent section, but in the, in the definition. Right, so your yes. hundred percent correction yes. just needs to be yes. somewhere else. Correct. And I, I did have a follow up question uh, to Mr. Shaw, um, so that um, if if uh, under a uh, PUD, once the ordinance is in place and should it be in place, um, if a an additional PUD application comes forward and it meets all the criteria, there are no changes being uh, requested by the applicant. Is that considered by right? That, only to the extent that it, it would adhere to whatever it is that's been adopted in that PDR, unless there, it, there's some other types of planning and development that you're talking about, because there's also PUDC, commercial types of planning. Right. The reason I ask that is that it seems like on the front end, our work is really key to how this is un this unfolds, because if that's the case, that you know any additional PUDs that come forward. Um, you know, we're 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 looking at already specifying what those requirements are. Um, so getting it right, you know, from the start is really important. Um, and, and one last thing, I'm sorry. Um, when we're looking at voluntary proffers, um, the uh, you know there are certainly with the uh, fiscal uh, impact of developments on the infrastructure. Uh, clearly, we have that, but there are also non fiscal impacts on the community. And so, uh, looking at the, the need for um, when a developer offers and makes a voluntary offer 
of let's say you know so many workforce housing units how um, do we go about incorporating that is that through the application process or how do we do that should that be the case uh, i'm not quite sure frankly i'd have to defer to ms c giles about that one <laughs> it would be in the development plan okay. and it, it would have to be voluntary and, and that's approved by the town council it is yeah okay. it, it would have to be in there um, well Yes, it would have to be in the development plan, and again, um, and it could not be a conversation that initiates with the town at all, so it would have to be a, a completely voluntary offer. Okay, I have a, a, an undermine. So, section 29.3 under application and approval, uh, the, the underlying sense where they did the modification. Um, I'm just not familiar with the term concept, concept sketch. Is that defined somewhere else, or is that like a professional norm that we can rely on? Like, how do we, how do we know? Uh, it's an alternative nomenclature for rendering, or, yes. or a scenario. Um, it, it's just a graphic representation of what's being proposed uh, for the development. I mean, it's it's not a site plan. Uh, it can make distinction. It, it's just a a rendering of graphic representation of like the charrette. Well, somewhat, but not a is actually an exercise where you would actually have people okay. weigh in about uh, making decisions by design. Um, it, it's just like a graphic representation that people mm -hmm. can visualize the kind of concept, concept. right? And, I mean, yeah. As you can see, you know, where the units may be, um, um, as I said, on the earth, so some landscaping, the potential uh, at ingress, egress access, uh, without being specific, you know, but just give you an overall sort of. Uh, uh, graphic uh, de depiction of what it is that, that is being proposed. Okay. So, three pictures to help your mind grab the words on the page. I, I think I would uh, yeah. say bingo to that. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm just making sure this gray man is a little slow on. No, no, I, 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 I think that's an accurate representation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I, and I have one last question on. Um, the by right section uh, 29 6, where it talks about accessory structures. Um, those are uh, listed in the by right section. And, you know, uh, I'm curious because in other parts of the town, to get a shed that's over a certain size, you have to get a permit, and it's not by right. And I have to take a look at that. It's okay. that, actually something that's not associated as a use by right. I my experience yeah. is indeed 29 is, 6. Okay, because it's usually attendant uh, with the, the principal use of the property and therefore on the same lot. And if it's uh, anything more than that for square footage is concerned, that would actually rise to the level of having a condition use permit for that. I'm not, don't get me wrong. I mean, you uh, have alluded to that, pointed that, and know that'd be the case, but I have to actually. Right. So that's even after the, the initial zoning. Uh, yeah, I, I realize so, that. Yeah, so, well, that's what, but accessory structure. So, if you were to have a clean lot and you were to present a site plan and you had an accessory structure on that site plan, you don't need a separate permit for that. Right. It's but all after at the same time. It's sold. Yeah. And, and, and it's in the ordinance under the right. PUD. Right. Can a resident come forward and say, well, I don't need to apply for a permit because it's already in the ordinance? No. No. Okay. I mean, right. any instance where somebody would have an accessory structure, and, and if they were asking, for example, a site plan and a, and a request for, for approval of the zoning permit, you can't just arbitrarily, uh, for example, approve the house and then say, oh, by the way, now I'm going to shed or a pool on the property. Uh, that would be a violation because you're not, you didn't specifically permit that. Uh, but if there is some language that you were referring to, uh, Ms. Luna, that this says that an accessory structure uh, in some instances, it arises to the level of having a condition of use permit approved for it. I'm not aware of that, but they, they, it says by right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, but I, I'll go back to um, 29 um, um, 4, I think. 29 4. Uh, Elevation well, wait a minute. I hadn't highlighted it on my computer. I'm sorry. I'm, jump, I'm jumping between multiple documents oh. here. Um, but it says no development shall occur without um, the development plan. So you still have that overlay. No development. So it's not qualified as to time. You would have to amend the development plan. Oh, so I, 
Right. I think I think you guys are thinking on different. Uh, yeah, we were thinking so so different. You're thinking as, as pertaining to the development itself. I think Ms. Luna is yeah. thinking of post development once the private person owns the property. Understood. Then but it's still in the PUD, and no development, no anything, no construction of any type can happen unless it is um, again approved. Okay. So even even after the overall right. development is done and all the houses are sold, that still is part of the, it. Still pertains the way it's written now because it says no construction, no anything. I mean, that's so a lot of times. It, can I may I interject just a moment? I think there's some cross. I just want to clarify a few things that I'm hearing. Is that okay? Yes, please. So the original the original PUD as it is now is based on the R2A zoning district, your current PUD, not this draft now, which has been changed based off feedback. But it includes accessory structures as a permitted use already. Um, so that is not a, that that addition of accessory structure as a permitted use is not a change. Um, so I did want to clarify that. Now, certainly a building permit may be required for a shed of a certain size in R2A um, or, or a zoning permit even, but uh, based off of this current PUD ordinance that we received in the R2A that is on your website currently that we based this off um, on the accessory structures is a currently permitted use. Um, another component of that with regard to the development plan that I have seen in other um, areas where a PUD is provided is that um, you the developer could decide at the onset of the project and submitting the development plan and any design guidelines or other proffered materials to uh, include the option for a shed or other accessory structure and identify what those requirements would be, whether it's materials or a minimum size or height, or maximum size or height, excuse me, maximum size or height, or other defining components of that. They wouldn't necessarily show it on every single lot that's proposed, but it could be part of their design guidelines for the property or for their overall development that they submit as part of the application. So we're not suggesting that every accessory structure would have to come in for a, a, a rezoning and, or an amendment to the general development if it's included on the original development plan is that correct if it is or part of the design guidelines for example right right, right. or other right. proffers there are many different ways to get that as a component included to get it included as but at some point along the way it would have to be approved uh, or approved but under miss luna's um example it had not been addressed previously and and the only reason I'm bringing this up is because if this is not the intent, then then the rewording it's 29-3 paragraph three because it's what I'm looking at. Um, then that might need to be reworded. But uh, the way it is now, assuming that is in fact the intent, um, if it were not addressed on the front end as you're suggesting in one in one fashion or in some fashion, um, it would in fact require a subsequent approval. But but yes, you're right. It could be included as a these, these could be allowed later, or it's, or it's a hypothetical, that sort of thing, just that it would be approved approved on the front end. That would be fine. And if I, since you're talking about um, by right uses, if I quickly, um, I will just say that under the conditional uses, um, this is just food for thought items, uh, what's the, the new letter? E, G, E, the fitness center slash gym, G, medical clinics, and H, professional administrative offices. Um, those are um, part of the Northern Neck uh, PDC economic development strategy as high priorities. And so, um, honestly, to be consistent with that, they probably should be um, by right uses, but I'm just food for thought. They are, they are high, high priorities for the regional economic development strategy. Is there interest in that being a change or is there discussion from the planning commission on that comment? I, I think that that would be compatible with a like PUD. 
for C, but when we're looking at this is a residential oriented community development, I, I think that there still needs to be um, a little bit tighter control on that. I, I understand that what you're saying, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there needs we need to abdicate scrutiny in that particular use. Yeah, and, and I was thinking pretty much the opposite that um, we need to facilitate um, and make it as easy um, and, and uh, you know achievable for uh, companies and, and, and medical facilities and doctors offices um, you know to uh, simplify the process. So I think that it should be by right. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, but. <clears throat> So this is a residential community, is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's a potential residential community. Um, I've lived in planned residential communities before, and typically if they have, say, a doctor's office associated with it, it's not actually in the development, it's on the edge of it, like on the outside of it, um, so that it's not just accessible to the people who are typically in the development, but people not associated with development in any way, shape, or form as well. Um, so it's more of an outside thing. Um, and therefore the building is not controlled by the development group that made the development or, or any of those kinds of things. Um, so, you know, I can see a, um, I can see parks and things like that being by right, but I, I think that those particular things still kind of fall more into the commercial realm than the residential realm. I mean, this is my personal opinion, um, but they feel more commercial to me than residential. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too, that it would be clustered together with um, the commercial. So and if we did a PUDC, yeah. I absolutely they should be by right in that. Yeah. I would agree with that statement. So... Yeah, it, 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 yes, no. Is it reasonable yeah. to assume that they already are by right in our commercial district now? Um, I'm not sure about that exactly. That's 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 yeah, but that's that's a pretty reasonable assumption for that particular scope of use mm -hmm. for those uh, administrative offices, medical clinics, and fitness centers and gyms. Yeah, yeah, I think we found that in C one. Yeah. So, so it is permitted use of right. So, right. In my hearing, does anybody really want to change this or, or is this is so much the way to see your I'm good with the way it is. Keep it. Yeah. Keep it. Okay. All right. Okay. Keep it. All right. Moving right along. One option on that that could be considered if the when this is presented to, to a developer is that I have seen um, CUPs associated with the rezoning done concurrently to streamline the process. So if they have a medical clinic or a fitness center that they are proposing as part of the application, those two applications could move through the process together. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. I have two components to 294, which is now number number four for the assessment of environmental impact. So as this is written, um, I have a couple of questions. One is it references items that are deserving of protection and I don't understand how one wraps their head around what is or isn't deserving. Um, Cause I would think that you could easily just dance around that term to um, include or not include things that were you know, favorable from your perspective. So I, I don't know if that gets defined somewhere else. I didn't find it somewhere else it gets defined. My other, um, interest in this section is it talks about how are you going to um, protect and maintain them uh, but what is more common is that you can't you end up breaking some of these things in the process and the question becomes uh, identifying those things that you can't um, and then identifying how you're planning to mitigate and that's not here it's just sort of this is that like we're putting a fence around the pretty things and it'll be fine but that's not really how things usually go. Some portions you can and some you can't. It seems like identifying both, but only identifying the things that you're going to protect without the list of things you're not going to protect. Right. So the I believe that's a represent a representative reference to uh, articles 19, 21, and 22. 
So it, it's not necessarily the, this is not the location to put that because this is generally concerning the PUD exclusively. And if we were to look at something like you're talking about, that needs to be comprehensively applied to all development. This is saying that the statement should be in addition to the things that are in those standards. So we're only asking them to additionally provide information on what they're not going to mess up. I don't understand the value in that. It seems to me that we're more interested in them identifying the things that they either can't protect and just can't protect them or can't protect what they plan on doing something about it. I don't really understand the value in this section of identifying the things that are going to be just fine. Which so this this section talks about 29-4 and a revised strike through for five or which which section are you referring to? Assessment, assessment of yeah. environment. Okay. Like, yeah, was four now five. It's the part that we added. It's in the one dated uh, April, I mean May 11th, and you might be looking at a different one. This is intended to be above and beyond the requirements of your generalized development plan, which is provided in Article 19's requirements. Uh, those requirements do cover such things as identifying specifically boundaries of water bodies, floodplain, resource protection area, watershed, wetlands, um, those sorts of things. And this is going above and beyond to say, we would also like to identify how protection and maintenance of such scenic assets or other natural features will be accomplished. So we're drawing attention to the fact that you need to submit this as part of your generalized development plan. And as part of your application, we would like to see a uh, statements with regard to protection and maintenance. Perhaps the change here would be to add in any mitigation of, of impact. Um, however, any mitigation of impact would need to be included in the packet. And as previously mentioned by others, it would have to be voluntarily proffered to ensure um, that it was included. So those scenic assets or other natural features those are defined by the town somehow in this process? It is, we have not included def, a specific definition right. of scenic assets or natural features. However, in Article 19, um, the general development plan identifies which natural features must be shown on the generalized development plan. So this is referencing back okay. uh, to that. So how do you deal with the deserving of protecting what preserving of protection language about does that mean that just identify the things that are already required to be protected or is this expansive beyond things that would already be covered? I think the language is is purposefully vague so that if there are other items on the site that aren't necessarily specifically identified in a list that the the town can help the the developer identify those things. If the town has a, a list of all of its features that you feel are deserving of protection um, that are above and beyond what is in the generalized development plan, we could enumerate those specifically here of, of items. What we don't want to do is make this ordinance excessively complicated by repeating items that are already required under Article 19. It doesn't abdicate any requirement for state environmental review, DEQ, or any other you know, federal requirements for wetland protection. To avoid the, the vagueness of this, can we just get rid of deserving and just say, talk about identifying things that will be protected and preserved? Yes, we can make that change. It's fine. And there's certainly some things that are deserving of protection that may not be specifically identified here. I mean, archaeological, architectural assets, I mean, a, a number of things that you can think of potentially about that don't rise to the level of something that would have to be you know, something that would uh, be permitted through a, yeah. you know, it's referred to as a joint permit application for DEQ for 
in conformance with um, um, section the Clean Water Act or you know the requirements for non-tidal and tidal wetlands and uh, the, the Bay Act and the other things that are specifically referenced uh, in in the ordinance that, that need. Uh, for statutory requirement need to be addressed uh, and how, how you would uh, deal with that. There are, I, I'm giving you an example there, and there may be some other things as well that you I think would be appropriate to preserve uh, whatever that they may be. So it could be simplified to just have seen, have scenic assets or other natural features. And then it just, the language would just continue as it. Uh, and just skips the deserving of protection and preservation. Yes, yeah, so just yeah. take those. Start, no, no, no. Uh, keep the, the protect and preserve because that's what you're asking to identify, which is where identify where you're protecting and preserve. It, it just gets rid of the normative component of this. That's it's, I think it's gonna be hard for the applicant to figure out what, what the town means by preserving. It's gonna be hard for us to figure out like what we meant if they either achieved it or failed. What we can do, I, I that. Yeah. We can do that. We can make that change. We could also add a sentence after the accomplished at where that ends to say um, examples of such features include but are not limited to and provide a list of examples. And, and did we get agreement that while we're not compelling mitigation that we're asking them to identify the mitigation um, as opposed to this section would sort of just be they would only identify the things that they're going to protect and preserve. I think if they're planning to do that, they should identify, protect, preserve, and mitigate. Um, and it would be up to them as to whether they, they could always choose to say, we're not going to mitigate, right? I mean, that's, that's an option, right? So in terms of it being a proper still. So, so we're, we're not compelling, but it would, we get the whole list as opposed to a partial list and then right. we'll look somewhere else for another list. So um, rather than adding an what would probably be a, what I think is both unnecessary and exhausted list of random other things that might be deserving of protection. Could we maybe change it to um, scenic assets or other natural features, features which should be uh, uh, protected, preserved, um, or mitigated? Or something to that effect. If you see where I'm going, I don't, I don't have the exact verbiage, but something to that effect, so that we get it by just changing a couple of words and adding maybe one or two instead of uh, coming up with a list of um, a mulberry bush and a tree or something. Do you, and, do you have a problem with how it's written right now? Like, this doesn't give me any heartburn at all. If we and we're spinning like we're spinning, yeah. spinning around on this thing. I have to, there's nothing wrong. I don't think there's anything wrong. I, I don't have any problem with it. If, if um, I think and maybe I'm asking that to everybody. I, well, I think Will has a point about the mitigation. But if mitigation is specified within these other pieces, I am fine with how it's worded. But you, you know, the RPA under the Chesapeake Bay Act does have mitigating circumstances that you can do. For example, if you uh, have a tree that you would like to have taken down, you have to mitigate that if it's um, a viable tree or whatever uh, with planting additional trees. So there are already built in mitigation aspects to the Chesapeake Bay Act as well as some of the other Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act. But specifically, your point that is codified already in the ordinance as it relates to the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Area Overlay District. And that, that district overlays all old land in uh, the town of Columbia Beach, and therefore, uh, the, what you would have to do is actually specifically reference there. And uh, any development uh, would have to conform to that as it relates to the floodplain overlay district and the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Area Overlay District. So that's already referenced. By those articles, they not any developer would have to uh, obviously comply with that. Uh, so you, you wouldn't necessarily have to um, enumerate or cite all of that because ultimately <laughs> it, it's incumbent upon any developer that has to comply with those things anyway. Yeah, because of the overlay and the encumbrances for the super city regulation, I'm pretty comfortable with the ambiguity because there's a lot of specificity in the other superseding levels of regulation. Oh. So the, the distinction between the, that normal process, which is we would approve this, and then we would assume that they're going to go work with these other agencies and 
long after we've approved it, we wouldn't feel like we we need visibility on it later. This section allows us to just say, what is your intent right. on what you plan on? You know, what do you think is important? What do you plan on protecting, preserving, or mitigating against? And 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 not as a compulsory thing, but to identify that up front as a part of the application component. Right. right. So that's the difference as we see this in advance, even though we don't have sort of regulatory over it, but they'd have to communicate their intentions um, as part of the packet, as opposed to us just sort of a, yes, but but so the communicating time. that intention and, and getting overtly or excessively complex and, and, and burdensome for that intention where it's it's generally a, Yes, as a developer, I'm going to do my best to make sure that I maintain the natural aesthetic and beauty of the environment, and it's going to be in character with the developments of the town and the associated areas, be it natural or man-made, it is kind of the general qualitative statement, and, and I'm not sure, like, what's the, why, what's the benefit of you really like, digging into this for identification purposes, other than striking and preserving? Is, is there something else that will really enrich this uh, that will enhance the intent or, or benefit from this conversation? I, I, I'm sort of now lost. Okay, I think we had two pieces. One was to just make it simpler, get rid of the serving so we don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Um, and the other part is about including not just the things. It, it would seem strange to say we're going to. We're going to ask you to tell us all the good things you're doing okay. without saying this everything you're doing, right? Because we've actually not included the, the mitigation part. We've only asked them to, to identify the things that they're going to protect and maintain. But it's part so of it's sort of like we're asking them to make them like so it's part of themselves the look good. Like what's the point of right. the but it's part of the development process stuff. when you submit a site plan, it, it there are very extensive requirements for what you're going to do for mitigation, not only post construction, but during construction and during site movement and how you're going to move things around and what you're going to do for sediment control. And you have to identify specific trees that you have to preserve within uh, the requirements of the town. So they want to respect the understand that. I'm, I'm trying to figure out this section needs to serve some purpose, right? Because okay. it, it, otherwise it's just a burden, right? It's just a burden of the applicant, right? So if it serves a purpose, what is that purpose? And does this language line up with that purpose? That's sort of where I'm trying to get to. Um, I think that the, if I may, if I may, I think that I did hear some consensus and I would agree that adding the word mitigation here would be appropriate. So uh, identifying how protection, maintenance and mitigate or mitigation of such assets, natural features will be accomplished. I think that mitigation would be an appropriate addition to this section. Now, I guess the other point where you were talking about this is handled in other places. Does the now, does the such statement shall be, since this is not an exhaustive list, um, what are we accomplishing with that? I guess that's is that, is that where you were going about. Right. This is just kind of an easy line. Yeah, it's not a devolution of right, for application requirements and application purposes. This is just essentially a hey, we, we want to do this development, submit the development plan. We have the PUD. Uh, and, and this is basically in the application process how we intend to meet the requirements of the PUD. And if there is a, a line item in here on the assessment of the environmental impact of that planned unit development, then the my interpretation of what we're trying to accomplish here is we just want a general understanding of the intents of the developer at the time of the submission, because it will change over the, the course of the development. But at the time of the submission, do they have any uh, assessments of environmental impact? So typically that's, that's anything from geotech uh, surveys to em environmental surveys, uh, drainage and uh, soil quality and condition. Uh, any of those types of assessments are typically conducted as part of the due diligence and uh, development of the uh, second phase after all of this is happening, once they've gotten the PUD. So that's when they really deep dive into a lot of the environmental assessments beyond what would be considered cursory due diligence to make sure that they're going to be able to physically and environmentally meet the statutory requirements for the, the development itself um, in, 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 as a decision-making um, 
milestone for their economic assessment. Like they're not going to be able to get funding for um, doing a, a, a development without having some level of an environmental assessment for the banks for them to have enough information to be able to underwrite to say here I'm going to give you millions of dollars to, to do this development to only find out that oh we can't do that because there's endangered species xyz or it's predominantly wetlands or whatever the case may be that will throw a wrench into that so there's some stuff that's built into that so what my understanding of the intent is which kind of bring, bring it back around is that we just need some kind of affirmation that there is awareness on the part of the development and the parties involved in that that there is an environmental impact and a at least cursory assessment and identification of what those anticipated environmental impacts that are present and that they're going to be correctly doing. Is that yeah, anybody else? Uh, that? Just that uh, you know, it's the application requirements uh, to include those uh, mitigating efforts and um, the fact that it wouldn't supersede any of right. the. Uh, overlay district requirements or so uh, yeah so we're we're agreeing that if we add uh, remove um deserving and add uh you know mit mitigation to the requirement of the environmental assessment in fact that that is meeting the intent of what we're trying to accomplish so, i think so i, would, I think okay yeah. i think that the intent part the, the last part that i was trying to get to so the part about in addition to applicable standards I, I think we're either meaning to say including, right? So the word either standards including Article Nine, or it's sort of an EG. It's a, it's either including or such as. We're either trying to say including because we're trying to highlight these particular standards, or it's just an EG to say like, I mean that's really just a proxy for saying other environmental standards, right? So to try to figure out the, what's the maybe the um, Berkeley group can answer that. Why particularly did you highlight these? Since this is not sort of the bucket list, it's sort of just a subset of. The things that they can and we can add. your point is well taken we were trying to cross-reference that there are other that for instance erosion and sediment control plan is noted in article 19 um, that there are other standards but certainly this is not a, a comprehensive list to your point surely your zoning ordinance references that everything should be in compliance with um state code and there would be you know the entire ordinance and other overlays must be met as well, but we can we can modify that statement to reference as you, to, to your what I believe your point is, is that it should also be in addition to any other applicable standards, including these articles, but not exclusive to those. Right. That, that's, that's where I was trying to head. Thank you. I mean, you can just choose the verb. It's included when not limited to. Oh, there it is. <laughs> what do you say? Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm done. Yeah, I hate I hate to bel belabor this specific point further, but however, I would since John mentioned the cultural or I'm sorry, archaeological features, I am not seeing that as one of the requirements to be identified on article in Article 19. Do you, would would it is there a desire from this commission to include scenic assets, cultural features, or other natural? features should cultural resources cultural or archaeological features be included in this list as well i i think so because if we're in a historic area and we don't know what might be out there so uh, if there's hidden jewels then we want to preserve those yeah yeah because we're easily defined actually let's see yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and i uh, uh the artifacts okay yes for your knowledge, in working in a historic environment previously, one of the, the the items that came out of a similar statement like this that included cultural resources was a proffer related to should an archaeological site be found that was not previously identified that the developer would consult with the town on how it should be managed. Mm -hmm. yep. So I am hearing consensus that we will add cultural features to number five here. Yes, yes please. Yes. No. Okay. All right. Are we ready to go to district regulations? Yes. Yes. All right. So 
29.7 district regulations. Let me bring up my list again. I've had a few okay. other things up. <laughs> okay, that's all right. No, thank I think you. It would, I, I would appreciate your patience with us. We yes. do this. Um, I'm, I think it will be best if Caroline leaves her screen up here, but I'll be referencing myself the um, the revision summary. And I'm moving down to 29-7. Yeah. There, there are several items here in 29-7. The first is related to um, ADUs. I'd like to leave that discussion to first focus on the general density um, and the changes there. So there was changes um, with a desire to increase density uh, with regard to allowing multifamily residential. And our understanding was that would be up to 25 units an acre. Yes. So we did um, increase and provide various densities for different residential types. And I, we do have a note here that some localities would include uh, a maximum overall density for the development. There, so there's much variation on density um, within residential PUDs. We've, we looked at many, many ordinances. Um, we have Darla, who you met last time, has, has administered several of these uh, PUDs as well. And so these were the numbers that we were finding to be in the, the acceptable or best practice range <laughs> for different types of units. Um, based off of the discussion that we heard, we did not include a maximum overall density for the development. However, if you would like to include that as an overall cap, um, we would suggest a range between 10 to 14 units per acre. And that could be um, new, that could be increased as part of a development plan um, with a particular request for a waiver and and that could be approved as well with the waiver provision that we have included in here but it is kind of telling the developer this is the range that we're expecting out of a development unless you you give us good reason otherwise um, kelly are you referring to single family dwellings or multi-family dwellings so as what Caroline has shown on the screen here, it's a single family detached dwelling. We have a six units per acre. So that would be overall uh, within for the different for all of the single family detached dwellings in, in the property or in the project would be six units per acre. The duplex or single family attached would be 10 dwelling units per acre max. And then multi family dwellings would be 25 dwelling units per acre. If you were to add an overall density, that's what we would suggest would apply to overall all of the dwelling units per all of the acreage committed to residential. Uh, is there a benefit adding that maximum other than adding a cap? It really would require, it would, I mean, the, we have we have various ways built in to um, encourage a mix of unit types. That would be another way to do it. So um, by, for instance, it, it would require the developer to, to intermix dwelling units to get to that max. Um, we've got that built in elsewhere, but this is yet another way so that if you were to, to do a mix of six and 10 dwelling units per acre, you would be under um, the, the max 10 units per acre. If you were to do all multifamily dwelling, you'd really have to have a mix of these other types to um, hit that overall max range would be one. Like it's, it's really trying to encourage a high quality development that's got plenty of landscaping and open space integrated into the overall plan as well. Okay. So we, last time we spent a lot of time deliberating on that and, and kind of skipping forward where, uh, I guess it's 29.84C, uh, where there's no more than 60% of the total number of residential units shall be in the same category. I just don't want to 
I just don't want to be overly burdensome or complex or require a lot of crazy math to be able to come up with. A, 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 I'm a big fan of these uh, simplified ratios for you know 60% of a single type and then um, being able to by uh, default force the other types of development for the remainder at, uh, at a minimum requirement. So um, I think it's pretty well covered. I don't okay. they have to feel compelled to put a maximum or I think that covers it. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I like that. Um, okay. I have a question about density. Um, you know, uh, if if um, if we are in a situation where the PUDs have a uh, an applicant that is proffering um, workforce housing, I would like to see that we allow for um, the applicant to increase their density at a ratio of one to one for every single workforce housing unit that we allow greater density on the site uh, to help offset the cost of, of those units. And that's something that's done in other PUDs. Um, Kelly, have you looked at that before? A replacement uh, as an incentive to the developer? We have looked at it quite a bit um, and looked at different ordinances. Um, in that case, I would probably suggest that we do have a maximum density across so that you still ensure that you, you have a high quality development and that there isn't a, a concentration of um, the, it, in, intense development for what is an environmentally constrained area or town in general. Sure. Um, we did not include that in here. And I, in terms of the one-to-one, -one, we would need to look at state code. There are some different state code requirements with regard to what those ratios can be. Um, and we would have to make sure that it falls within that. So I, I know of several PUDs throughout the state that have that ordinance in there. Right, but keeping in the character of the limitations that we have, uh, i.e. 35 foot height requirements mm -hmm. or maximum so we cannot do high rise development style we can't do no, no. um it, it, so a majority of our stuff is going to be low rise and we have a 60 percent maximum of a single type of uh the use for residential so how in how do you envision with the um increase in density that we've already got how much more can you cram in there and still fit in the box and by doing this one for one? Well, if, if there's a way for us to help offset the cost for the developer to contribute something that is so vitally needed, then um, maybe we can write language in here that uh, is a... Um, I'm talking about like a physical space representation mm -hmm. of... Well, if you're looking we're, at... We're talking about cubic space and we only have so much space that we have available because we've got height limitations and then whatever the, the area is total we've got limitations on the amount of units that we can have for um in any specific residential type and we've already increased the capability of the uh, developer to increase that density um to a higher level how much more could we quote unquote offer and, and still fit it inside of this like physically because like, I understand what you're saying conceptually and, and that's fantastic but I, I don't like when that translates into physical buildings and space and making sure that you have egress and right of way and still have green spaces and all of these other things you, you run into just you, you plain run out of space and and i'm i'm curious like th this one-to-one -one well we we increase the uh, density for the uh, attached to multi-family uh, up to 25 per square uh, acre yes um so i'm not suggesting that we go over that that's okay. not that's not what, what i'm suggesting it's just that um in other areas uh there have been um you know incentives created that allow for um, we don't we don't know what might come down the pike. There might be home ownership opportunities, and um, it could be that the workforce housing could be rental as well as home ownership. And so I just want to um, you know make it as as uh, financially feasible as possible for the developer, should he 
or they want to do that. Right. So in excess of what we have for the densities, how how much more what's that increase in density for that one to one I wouldn't recommend program? increasing it because I think we have okay. so, so I think we've come up with a good number. That, that's what I'm saying. That. You yeah. already pushed it out to mm -hmm. the point where there, there's there's not really any le room left for concessions or trade-offs or incentives because we've incentivized them inherently because we've already increased the uh, utilization rate to what we can figure out being the maximum so, for each housing type. So yeah. rather than talking in vagaries, I did a little math and I had to get the calculator because I'm wearing my shoes. Um, <laughs> So at 60% density for each of these things based on 10 acres, although it would probably not actually be 10 acres because of bodies of water, et cetera, et cetera. But for easy math, because I need that, um, for multifamily dwellings, the maximum would be 150 of those. Mm -hmm. right? For duplex or single family attached dwellings, the maximum would be 60. And for single family, the maximum is 36. So I think they're already pretty well incentivized to maximize, I mean, to get as much bang out of their buck as they possibly can. I mean, it, I'm just looking, that's what I'm trying to like, how, do, how would that yeah. play out? In, and I understand the concept and, and the idea of wanting to incentivize policy and, and in, inherently induce that with the development, right? That's what I'm saying. Like, it's I think we need something palatable and, you know, I think that, you know, by increasing the density, it would uh, create, you know, more uh, concern. And so, um, you know, I'm just uh, thinking outside the box and looking at creative ways that we can offer. Um, but if that, if there's no uh, ability or if there's no will to do that, then I don't want to push it. Uh, I, I think that would have to be a um, as presented basis. If a developer came to us and said, I would like an exception because I want to do this, then we would have to look at that. And, and both the planning commission and the town would have to say, I think that's a good idea because, you know, my assumption is even if we have these numbers codified here, that if the town decides to make an exception for an outstanding plan, that they have the authority to do that. Is that correct? Is that right? Could they go beyond um, what's here in the ordinance? As long as it's memorialized in some fashion that the contemplates a density bonus. That's it, density so, bonus. So, yeah, yeah, I was thinking it, as the language, it, as we conceptualize this one large parcel, right? There's a ratio of like so many per acre and you're looking at the whole thing. Maybe there's some latitude about thinking about density within an acre with this concept of the right to allow, in terms of incentivize, you would take less infrastructure to be more highly dense in within an acre, within within an an acre rather than that would be then offset in other areas. Yes. Right? Kelly, is it possible that we could look at, at that um, as um, maybe um, that the uh, we have the ability through this ordinance to uh, to, re to review a density dentist issue that might come forward as a bonus. So as a bonus, in addition to these, den this this existing proposed density. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. <laughs> I said, are you looking for density bonus language that would be above and beyond this density? Yeah, should should um, uh, you know a proffer come forward? Um, you know, if, if there's a way, as as you know, John was talking about, um, that we could write you know a simple phrase to say, and uh, bonus density would be a consideration under certain conditions. We need to be careful and probably consult with the county or the town attorney on that specific language as it as it presents to affordable housing specifically. There are two uh, state code authorizing codes sections that can be considered, and that is part of why we did not include the we went this route with the diversity versus the affordable density bonus because that there are two sections of co state code that could be used and there are different percentages and density bonuses that can be 
the town could explore through those. Um, my suggestion would be if the town wants a density bonus that it would need to look at those sections closely um, in consultation with the town attorney to make sure that any uh, any proposed change along with that would one which which ones of those code sections do you want to apply and it would be most appropriate for the town. And there the section on density bonuses for affordable um, dwelling units under state code is very, very lengthy and has a lot of different requirements and a lot of different um, components that the town could consider for inclusion there. So well, I'm satisfied with the fact that um, <laughs> there are state provisions should there be a will for that, and that's that's good enough. Okay, good. I was just wondering if the Berkeley group had examples from other localities that have achieved this that you could provide us, so we're not sort of writing this from scratch. So there, what we were finding was that when locality, we did find several localities that had an affordable dwelling unit ordinance. Um, huh. Those were we can provide those examples. Caroline, is that right? I believe it was Suffolk and, and Falls Church do have a affordable dwelling unit density bonus. That's correct. Virginia Beach does as well. Thanks. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. And if there, if you are interested in doing and adding those provisions just for the PUD only I think we would want to double or we would want to consider what the overall I think we would want to make sure we add the max overall density for the development as a base as well so that that density bonus does not result in a you know 40 to 50 dwelling unit per acre development yeah. I think that's that that's not that 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 going to happen I can tell you that right so that's that's yeah. what I was meaning of this. Yeah. in lieu of a maximum we've already kind of baked the maximum into it so there's not really a room for a bonus density because I of well, the fact that once you start I, I don't want to belabor I think we've spoken on it long enough but I just want to say that for the uh, single family dwellings at 10 um, units per acre we could increase it by, you know, one. Um, and if we were to do that, then it would, you know, um, uh, be beneficial to the developer should they want that. Well, that's single family attached. Well, yeah, and that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about just um, the multifamily dwellings yeah. um, because um, initially there was discussion of home ownership opportunities. Mm -hmm. So we want to look at both. And if it's home ownership and the, the majority of those units are um, the single family homes uh, that are attached dwellings or um, the duplex or single family attached dwellings at 10 units per acre, there could be some room there. That's what I'm talking about. Sure. Thank you. Can I ask a question about the, the density component where we're on, this is the beginning of 29.7, where they're talking about, um, essentially, I think that what you're trying to talk about is uh, maximum based on developable lands. Um, but this list, as it's sort of listed, I don't know if this was pulled from another model ordinance, but it seems to me that it includes things that can't be developed really under any circumstance and things that could be developed. It's just harder to develop in those areas. And it's a weird hodgepodge. And I don't sort of understand if, if we're really what we're talking about is, you know, of the things you can develop, um, this is the, the density we want. Because like I say, this list is a mix of hard to develop in and you can never develop it, right? So there's a big distinction to be between an RBA, which is a lot of hoops to jump through. Um, and the same thing with a special flood area. That's significantly distinctive to me than a lake, right, or a pond, or something, right? We like to, you know. So, so you get it. I'm trying to figure out. So this longer list really achieve what we're trying to do, which is just talk about like of the land you develop. We want this. You know, we want the following density. So the Berkeley group sort of explain where this, you know, this. There's a partial, in other words, also because it was like, well, if you're going to list things, like it's odd to me that 
wetlands isn't listed, um, but submerged land is, um, which is sort of a thought. Yeah. So, so where did this language come from? And, um, and if it is, is we looked at, we looked at, we looked at, we looked at, or can we just simplify this? We looked at several different um, ordinances. I will say not all ordinances include these types of provisions. Um, some allow your commercial areas to be included in your density calculations. Some um, include bodies of water and wetlands and other things to be included in your density uh, calculations. Um, and so we were trying to capture what we believed that that conversation to be last time that these various areas would be excluded and the densities that we propose, I think, are reflective of of that as well. Does that answer the question or is there more needed? I, and maybe that maybe first is it is the is the concern that RPAs and special flood hazard areas can be developed and therefore um, Yes, it just doesn't seem to be a consistent list. Like, like you said, you know, commercial area is included, and that's going to be developed. Um, we're sort of like pretending that it doesn't exist. Then other things on here clearly are never going to be developed, like a body of water. Then we have some stuff that might be developed. It's just a weird. If we're trying to do the accounting of this, I'm just wondering: is there a way to? We either need to be have a better exhaustive list, or maybe we could just not have this list and simplify this somehow and have language that's. Just a little. Clearer. I would just say that the maximum residential density for each housing type shall be calculated exclusively based on the, the area it occupies, and then get rid of everything else. Oh, only yeah. these densities That's typically right. would be these densities typically would also include things like roads, open space, parts of the development that are. Um, Kind of part of that residential component of the de development. So that's why we chose to use the excluded, excluding instead of only essentially the lots. Um, if you if you're interested in lot sizes, these numbers could be converted to lot sizes instead. But this gives more flexibility of using smaller lots but having more open space, for example. So, I guess, yeah, I think it's, so we can, then we can just say if, if we have to have an include and exclusion includes, um, Just is it specifically the resource protection areas and split flood ha special flood hazard areas that are the concern? Housing type. Yeah. Can we just stop at housing type? Just stop the statement at housing type? Oh, and that's what she's saying. The distinction is that whether or not it includes roads and parks and green space in right. your calculable area and right. what are you excluding? And right, and but um, so what I'm saying is, so maximum residential density for each housing type shall be calculated based on the total area within the PUD allotted to each housing type. Would, would those areas for that not include the open spaces, which I would assume would probably be surrounded by houses most likely, or at least um, in the same area as the residential areas versus totally outside of that area. Just, is what I'm saying just completely off the mark? Because if it is, feel free to tell me and I'll get a fixed gift. Caroline, did you look at any other definitions for this that we that could shed light or help explain perhaps better than I am? I've seen some definitions that are similar to this. Um, I think another potential way of phrasing it, it would be a little more vague, um, but saying that the maximum residential density for each housing type shall exclude undevelopable, undevelopable area. Um, I've seen language along those lines. However, that is more vague. Um, so it would be kind of considering how vague do you want to be? Is it sufficient to say it shall be calculated based on the total area allotted to each housing type? Or is there more specificity needed beyond that? 
to a set of yeah. developable and commercial? Yes. <clears throat> because you know that, that now you're including right the commercial stuff, but you're so you're separating the commercial stuff, but you're still including all of the area that is say parks and roads and etc. Right? I mean that's what it sounds like to me. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes, we can we can keep it undevelopable and commercial. Awesome. I plagiarized that from my <laughs> ear. I heard him say it. I'll jump to the microphone first. Uh, I mean, now you're getting into it in the circumstance of what's an undevelopable. Is it because I don't like the looks of that lot over there or that land? It's it's not attractive. It's ugly. Is that undevelopable? Of marshland. Kind of I know, but that's that's what specifically is already done. You're excluding these, and they've been enumerated, which you've excluded. And, and I would include jurisdictional wetlands in, in this list mm -hmm. here. Uh, but I think that is a way of ultimately getting at what it is that is something that Mr. Uh, uh, Knuckles alluded to, what's developable, what's not developable. And if you develop something, uh, why give somebody a bonus or an ability to develop something for all intents and purposes? They net couldn't do that in the first place ever. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. So the inherently the developer is incentivized to maximize the density because that's where he's going to get his highest return on investment. Absolutely. So there's the, the, the undevelopable is going to be minimized inherently through that process. Okay. Right. Yeah, because he, he's going to want, if yeah. he buys 10 acres, he's going to want to put as much stuff on that 10 he or she with it. They were going to put as much stuff as they can right. to be able to, you know, reach that maximum value that they can extract right. from that particular yeah. development. So right. there's there's not going to be any arbitrary undevelopable. Right. It's going to be a statutory undevelopable. Right. In just right. the way that it inherently. Yes. about so that, that's that's what i'm saying we don't need to overtly make this excessively complex just it's going to be by nature that way inherently right. i'm still confused as to what we're actually trying to achieve that's why it's so it's kind of all so yeah so like so say we have a, like we have a box right mm -hmm. and it's all just lawn right and we figure out that like oh okay the developer only put so much stuff in there and therefore the rest of it's going to stay green right Oh, and that's going to result in a certain density. But if that same box had half of those wetlands in the first place, oh, therefore they're going to have to be like they're not going to get as much in there. Even though I don't know that there's a meaningful distinction between the area that you go like, oh, I got to leave it green, and the area that was already sort of green because of nature said you're not going to be able to like build there. The well, so, it, right? it, so it, it, if you're just talking about things on the landscape per unit area, oh. This gets the heck out of hand, right? So, I don't know, like, in terms of as an example, yeah, so it's an area area versus the, the, the cumulative area, right? So, if, if you, you can only put per unit area so much in that cumulative area, but if we're talking about shrinking that cumulative area, and what are the exclusions on that? So, for that 10 acres, like you said, they can use up to 20% on a commercial use, right? So, that's excluded. So, you only have eight acres left to make housing. All right, so then of that eight acres, you can only maximize the density according to the schedule here. All right, so you throw in a little bit of wetlands, all right, so you lose another couple acres there. We're, we're, what we're saying is you cannot increase density or claim that your cumulative area per unit it can include that area that includes commercial and um, the wetlands, right, the undevelopable land. So your it, it's not so much as a reflection of the per unit calculations it's it's a so when you do that per unit calculations for the cumulative it reduces that cumulative total that you can meet for that yeah, I agree on that. Right. i'm just wondering what we're trying to achieve in terms of a planning purpose because but, what we're trying to achieve is at all and it doesn't really matter if it's right so grass or, or wetland or whatever you only end up with so much stuff on the landscape per acre grass is developable yeah. So, so the point is to not. Yeah, and we want to have yeah more stuff yeah. with more grass no, uh, and and so, less so stuff in areas that have things. No, hang on, that's, hang on. That's where this language is right. So, so grass is developed, right? You can develop grass. All you got to do is scrape it up and build something on it, right? But 
because you're limited to how many things you can put in that grassy space, you end up with a certain amount of open space anyway, because you're not allowed to put 100% of what you can put on it, right? We've already limited that. We've said you can only put 60% of one type of uh, dwelling structure. And so let's say you choose to do 60%, your full 60%, your 150 multifamily dwelling units, right? Now you that covers X amount of space. Now you've only got this much space to put the other things on, right? And then that spreads things out more. So it's you're going to inherently end up with open space in one way or another. Plus, you've got the road, those things that kind of push things apart. Um, so I think trying to, to really dig down into, it, it sounds like trying to really dig down into weeds of um, specificity of what's undevelopable, um, I, I think is, I think that's for this, for what we're trying to do, which is to get get somebody to fill out an application to say, I want to develop this 10 acre chunk of land. Then, then this gets them to fill out the application to, to, to develop that chunk of land. And then they still need to have the plan approved. So they submit the plan and we go, ah, no, that's, you don't have enough of this or that doesn't fit that or this just looks like crap, we're not taking that. Um, there's still an approval process in the, all of that that gives the planning commission and the town control over what happens versus just getting somebody in the door so that they fill out an application. I think if we get too far in the weeds of what they need to understand to fill out the application, it's a good example to me is if you get an email that you have to scroll to get to the bottom of, statistics say you're not going to read it. So if our regulations are the email that you have to scroll to get to the bottom of just to put in an application, nobody's going to do it. So I think as simple as possible for this to get the point across is kind of where we ought to be. And I think this pretty well comes in, unless we just change it to say um, undeveloped and commercial. That's the only other way I can see that we could get it simpler to have someone fill out the application and then approve plans post application process. I think that we're in agreement on, and especially considering it was Caroline's suggestion to to make that change that was originally suggested the, the commercial and undevelopable areas. That's that was my takeaway from this conversation. Okay. Good. Yeah, I'm good. Good. Anything else? Okay. Anyway, I think we've. Uh, I believe that covers the extent of the changes that we have here. Um, as previously noted, we did add language, um, and I think we scrolled down and looked at that with regard to the change with the mix of housing and then added language on the clustering of housing types. Um, that was 29-8.4. Caroline, if you wanna to scroll to that section. Yes, that's what we were talking that about. That was 60%, yeah, yeah. Yes, we covered that. And then we also added D below that with the intermixing of housing types throughout the development rather than just one single type. Yes. Those were the major changes here. Um, and I believe that we have our action items based on the discussion. Was there anything else that the Planning Commission would like to bring up in reviewing this applet, this uh, proposed PUD ordinance? Um, we did agree to put in the income ranges for um, the area median income so we can uh, specify you know, uh, the target for right. any of those. We're going to put that in definitions. Okay. Because it'll comprehensively apply to the entire town, not just the PUD. Okay. Yeah. And I believe if you are going to use definitions, I my suggestion would be to follow state codes, zoning ordinance, definitions for affordable housing as it specifically 
um, I the do not problem, The problem with the state codes, though, is that the AMI is calculated based on the metropolitan statistical area. And so it, that's different from different parts of the state. And so we are, wanted to tailor it to our community, to Westmoreland County. Good. And we'll do that in consultation with the town attorney and, and planning director. So <clears throat> that's good. Um, any other questions? Thank you very much for everything yeah. that you've uh, helped us with here and all the fantastic work that you've um, done to help us clean this up. All right. uh, just by uh, as a question on workflow. So the next iteration that you're going to help with is these couple of example ordinances and things that you're going to have as your next set of deliverables. What's your timeline like for our so I will defer to the town manager or to John on that. We were, our contract was for the first initial drafting and planning commission meeting. So any anything else through that um, additional work would need to, to be authorized by the town manager. We're certainly happy to help and we wanna support the town in this. And so um, we would certainly be happy to send along those additional examples um, regardless of whether you'd like additional support from us in making these changes. Right. There is one thing that I want to make reference to before we move on from this uh, that um, I'll defer to uh, the town attorney on in, in section 29-9, control of common areas. Um, Ms. Um, C. Giles has pointed out something about the language and um, uh, the control of common areas as it relates to a property owners association versus a HOA or homeowners association. And I'll just defer to uh, Vivian about this one. She is identified based upon the, uh, the Code of Virginia, some language in here that doesn't necessarily comport with uh, what it is in the code, uh, at the, the code section, and in, in, in specifically vis a vis property owners association versus a homeowners association. So I'll just uh, quickly, um, have Ms. Giles, uh, C. Giles, uh, kind of weigh in on that. Yeah, and so um, Berkeley folks, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the state code provisions, when I went to the enabling legislation, it just talks about property owners association. So I just changed it to fit for consistency, but also to correlate with state code to property owners association. And I've made a few other um, drafting suggestions um, just for purposes of um, uh, enforceability and administration. <laughs> Sorry, <You're> <laughs> and just enforceability and administration, not substantive changes, but drafting um, edits, and we'll get those um, to you. But not, nothing major, and that's sort of in the same category. It's just so, doing. So, in reference to that, um, I think John, maybe what you're talking about. I'm not bothered. So, section twenty nine nine, paragraph two, as property owners association, paragraph three, as homeowners association. So would the second one change? Yes. To POA? Okay. Yes. That would be making consistent. And so the reference would be yeah, POA. So all, yeah. So all references to HOA would be POA in the documentation. Okay. That's my that, that's my understanding, yes. But to make it consistent. I think some of that language was a holdover from the previous and yes. Yeah. Yep. I figured I've done it. I just penciled in changing it so that it's all the same. No, that's great. Right. Yeah. Any way we can, you know, make it easier by saying we're calling it a POA because the state does? Yeah. That, uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, and yes, and because that that's it's not only a term of art, it's a it's a creation of state statute. Right. Yes. Right. Okay. So it, it just to clarify, HOA is a is a euphemism, a, an improper euphemism, or is it a legally distinct thing from a POA? It, it's um so unless I'm missing the boat on this that the state changed it they I think years ago they were called HOAs and now they it's POAs because some of the properties involved are not homes, not homes. yeah yeah okay thanks I just, it's, it superseded that yeah it's good all right so so just a question for I know we don't have the town manager here but John just from your perspective. Um, when we're talking about if they could do more work for us, are we talking about a whole new contract and a major delay, or is this a um, change order? And, the, and if it gets approved, they a, a minor delay. And um, well, I think the town manager has a yeah, she's she's uh, on 
electronically. I think that was Nate to answer that question, but yes, the Berkeley's work um, is complete at this point, and we do thank them for all their efforts to get us to this point. Um, and the goal would be um, for Ms. Shay Giles as well as Mr. Shaw to be able to assist with any other revisions at, at this point. Um, but the goal would be to have this uh, ready and published um, for public notice for June 30th. Okay. That's reasonable as long as we can have adequate time to review prior to. Yes. Adult. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so question, if we're talking about, so India, when you talk about for June 30th, you're talking about for us to look at it June 30th or for the council to, because I know that's not a normal council date. No, that's us. It, that's that's sure. us, yeah. Okay. Yeah. For, your, yes, for, your, for your next meeting, obviously, if you all are at a point where you're comfortable with this, because um, we know there are a number of other items that you all are working on this year, we do not want to... Uh, Hold up some of your other work um, as it relates to, to this specific item. Yep, thanks. I just I um, I just needed clarification. It's been a long day. Next time. Resiliency is coming down the pipeline, so we get to that. <laughs> <laughs> is that the stage where we're just saying we agree with the language and we want to and it but then becomes a hearing? Or yes, that's what we're talking about is giving notice for a public hearing so that we can uh, publish not only for our consumption but for the public consumption, get feedback. Uh, make any adjustments at that public hearing uh, and adopt or uh, not adopt at that point. Yeah. So, sorry, I'm still being simple on this. So, so the next month, we say we agree, and then the hearing and the iteration after that, or no, no, the, the hearing is where we determine whether yeah, or not we'll we agree. We agree. Yeah. So we will have the opportunity to review all revisions to current draft status, and then at the uh, at that point, once we receive draft from staff, it will also be disseminated as part of the hearing notice. And at the hearing, we will uh, have already had an opportunity to review so we can have our own comments, thoughts, uh, additions, revisions, and amendments um, as we see fit. And we can also do that in the next week or two, if, if corresponding to the staff, if you come up with something else while you're in the shower tomorrow or whatever. We can continue to amend this uh, until the point at which it's published. And once it's published, that kind of puts a pause on it. And then that pause uh, happens until the hearing. And at the hearing, we take public comment. And then uh, after public comment is closed, we have another opportunity to discuss amongst ourselves. And then at that point, decide if we want to add, revise, um, or adopt as, as uh, proposed um, or reject at that point. So the thing that gets advertised to the public is this thing plus some additional staff recommendations. Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay. So for clarification, the first hearing at planning commission level won't be until July, probably. No, June. 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 That's what all of that's gonna happen. Okay. So they're going to take the, the remaining revisions that we've discussed this evening, do those, get us a clean copy. And we're going to have an opportunity to review, and at, at that clean copy will be part of the public notice of hearing. Right. And then at the public hearing, we'll have the opportunity to continue discussion um, as we so fit and see fit uh, and, and make any other tweaks in that journey. So they would have to get back to us in about two weeks. Basically, yes. So, to be able to give uh, enough notice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the things is that uh, we we got this copy on uh, Monday, and you know it it was kind of rushed in terms of us being able to go through it and analyze it and such. But if we can get a copy of the revision at a you know like the Friday before the meeting. Um, it, it helps, I think, when people are trying to juggle full-time jobs and, and make, uh, you know, an effort to volunteer here. I, I'm sure with the limited resources that the staff has that they dedicate as much as they possibly can to, to helping. Well, one, one thing that I learned, and I, I really wanted to share with everyone, Thank is that you. we can get copies of uh, these documents by going on to the town's website. Yes. And uh, because I heard that this was available last Thursday. A week ago, and I had no idea that if I just gone on to the town's website and clicked on it, and they would have been sending me the entire package. So thought I'd share that. Yes, I recommend it. 
that is fantastic uh, information for public dissemination. So that everybody knows. Yeah. For public consumption, go to the town website. That is where we house all of these documents. Okay. Um, yes, like I said. So once again, thank you to the Berkeley Group, and uh, I think that that wraps up this item on the agenda. And we'll be moving on to discussion regarding potential text amendment for conditional use in the resort commercial zoning district. Thank you very much for having us. Right. Thank, thank you. All. Y'all have a great night. So, Mr. Shaw, would you like to take it? I'll be right back. Yeah, <laughs> right, we'll give you a moment. We'll go ahead and discuss amongst ourselves and let you weigh in on that on your turn. Uh, the next uh, number six uh, discussion regarding potential tax amendment uh, for conditional use permit for theaters on the RC district. I'm Yeah, I'm in favor. I actually did some homework this time. No, oh, yeah. Yeah, I did. What's that mean? That means I actually read things before I came to you. You didn't tell them yourself. I am. And it, it, as I should have been. Yeah, I'm. So, the, yeah, the one I have more um, discussion about is the. Uh, is it not on here? Are we not talking about the um, so, short term? Yeah. No, no. Uh, I thought we were talking about the conditional. No, I mean tonight. Yeah. Yes, I like believe we are. Yeah. Seven A on your agenda. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. that's the housing committee of the yeah. short term. I've got to the short term. I'm sure. See, I did home. Yes. <laughs> Impressive. Uh, Mr. Shaw. Well, yes, uh, the next uh, item on the agenda is consideration of um, a request to men, amend um, the text in the uh, RC uh, Resort Commercial Zone District uh, to amend the language uh, associated with theater uh, from a use that is now identified as a conditional use. Uh, and, uh, and the request is to uh, make that a use by right. Now, Mr. Uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, Mr. Christensen has provided information to you uh, regarding uh, this request. Uh, there's language uh, that's actually been identified. You have a copy of it. Um, and Ms. Uh, C. Giles has is, is, uh, prepared this. Uh, it is simply a matter of identifying um, two things, which, which constitutes a use by right, that and that which is, constitutes a condition use. And that is contingent upon um, a certain level of uh, occupancy. And I'm, uh, so uh, Mr. Christensen has uh, provided information that would, uh, as a number of 70, there would be uh, the number of, uh, there would be occupancy, of 70 seats or 70, uh, that it, there would be uh, for this so that would constitute a use by right and anything that exceeds 70, um, uh, people uh, that would be uh, in attendance at the, the theater would constitute a conditional use. It really is now, and you, uh, you've had the, the prior discussion regarding this matter. Uh, it's for all intents and purposes, it's just a, a uh, I mean, certainly it's your prerogative to discuss it more, but it's at this juncture from my perspective that uh, does this constitute something that, uh, that is a motion from the Planning Commission uh, to uh, move this forward? Uh, that it would be he heard uh, through a uh, uh, by the public for a comment as a uh, as, a, <clears throat> as a, a, an amendment to the ordinance, and that of course, again, uh, it would be on June 30th uh, that this would uh, this would occur. So, having said that, if there's an action tonight uh, to make a motion to approve uh, what is being presented as the you know, text amendment to change. Uh, theater from a use uh, that is conditional uh, to a use by right. Uh, it is your certainly your opportunity now to um, take that action. Mm -hmm. um, so I, my interpretation of 70 people is the uh, 
permitted by fire, mar fire marshal occupancy of the space? You know, that is a, a number of that is a, a zoning consideration as a, opposed to the Uniform State by Building Code. The USB is going to have a maximum use um, based upon a classification. Right. But they, and that would still have to be the case as it relates to occupancy for the use group. Uh, and but uh, irrespective of that, uh, there's just for purposes as a practical matter for the space, uh, the, the determination has been made that that seems to be an appropriate number. Okay. Right. It was just a distinction between 70 persons and seats. Yeah, it will. So that's that's that distinction is all I'm trying to tease out of this because there's a difference between 70 seats and 70 people. Well, in this case, I think it's been written in such a way that Mr. Christensen is identified as being persons, if I'm not mistaken. Right. So, yeah, person, so. Yeah. and in uh, uh, point taken, that, that is correct. You're right, Mr. Howell, that, 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 that doesn't necessarily. Mean that that's synonymous, <laughs> but right. in this case, it is. Uh, it, that's what is being requested. Okay. Yeah, it, it's it's our intent that this is applied to anyone applying for a theater, and you know, and they intend to. Um, I would prefer to say seats to persons myself because that would that means that it would put everybody in the building, which is more like a requirement. For uh, safety purposes, sure. Uh, I, I rather, I rather it said seats to persons myself, but I can go with persons. But, the important thing here is that we don't care how many theaters are in. You know, this is not written for a specific theater. It's just saying, well, how are we going to define what a small theater is? In this instance, of course, it is specific to that zoning district. It's not. Just to clarify, you know, yeah, proposing this for the exclusive right, right, from just, the Exactly. Yeah. All right, just, just, I guess, for purposes to make sure that we, we for you know, public consumption, everyone understands that. Yes. The distinction that you that you put your finger on um, is my fault. <laughs> okay. um, but the reason uh, the reason that I drafted it that way is because it is an objective standard um, that you can that no one has to interpret. I mean, it's a it's a it's a uh, an established number, an objectively established number by the fire marshal. So if you wanted to um, increase a little bit to allow for staff to get close to this, the goal of 70 seats, if you want to make that, um, if, if that is in fact the goal. Um, but the reason that I put that is, is for um, uh, enforcement purposes, because you can have temporary seating, you can have folding chairs, you know, wh at what point is it designed for that 70 people that's why i i went the direction of the fire marshal determined number because that is a an, an established number it is not questionable it is what it is um because when you get into the other it, it and i think i see what you're I saying i appreciate the rationale okay no, no, I think, that's definitely I, yeah, I, yeah. I see what you're saying because it's if it's a, a theater depending on whatever whether it's a musical or a one act show the number of people involved in that production could vary extensively. So, yeah, I see what you get. Well, I, and I don't mind that idea. I, I can hear what you're saying, and it makes sense. And I would probably want to bump the number up, though, based on that. I mean, um, as, a, as a person familiar with counting seats, um, uh, that's that's one, for example, uh, unions go by when they say how big a theater is, how many seats do you have. So, you know, if it's over such and so many seats, then you've got a faithful scale, it, that, that kind of thing. But persons in a regulation like this does make more sense. I hear what you're saying. And I, I probably would like to have the number maybe a little bit more than 70. But I'm comfortable with 70 as the big break point between small and a bit large. Yeah, yeah by right versus conditional. Yeah. Um, just because you can still have 50 people watching the show and support staff, ticketers, yes. production people. At, at, at 20 is a lot of people to be involved in production, managing the whole show and everything. We so, get that. Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. so I, I, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with this 70 number. So, um, and, and that's why I wanted to make that distinction. So um, I like the rationale and, and 70 is good for me if we want to go ahead and, and 
pencil that in? Yeah. Is that well, any you know, broader discussion on that? Um, yeah. I think seventy is a is a, a number that works for me because it, it certainly meets the criteria for um, the fire department. But um, uh, and I'm definitely in favor of this, and I think it's a wonderful thing. And I really enjoy the fact that you know we're considering this um you know use and but i do want to say that i think that in the future when we have an individual council member uh, commission member um, that has uh, a, a direct involvement in the discussion that we handle it differently in the future so that was going to be the follow-up to this okay is, uh, we fully expect mr christensen to abstain from the vote on this i recuse myself yeah. And, so even the, from the discussion and, and have a discussion about how would a, a member of the town um, or general public go about bringing a, a, an issue like this uh, a code issue before um, the planning commission like what is that process so that we can have a conversation that's broadcast to the town so everybody can understand that this is not something that's it's limited or it is uh, exclusive to access, we can, uh, anybody in town can approach uh, the planning commission or planning office mm -hmm. in town with a uh, proposed amendment or change to any of the um, planning code for introduction into uh, our discussion and our agenda. So that this is not a closed process, this is a very open process. Um, and, and I just want to make that explicitly clear so that um, if somebody else were to come up with that, and if just for signage or landscaping or in any other ordinance that's it's included in um, our zoning ordinance, um, that is absolutely open and it is absolutely approachable by any citizen or any interested party in town to, to go ahead and um, use the zoning office as a conduit to be able to get these matters before the planning commission. I'd that? like to come on the, the process part of it. So, um, <laughs> If, if I looked at this in terms of what we really know what theater we're talking about, right? So in that sense, it would be nice if the things that we're currently charged to do, which is to look at impacts to adjacent uses, right? So in your number, it's like, why well, pick 70 or 50 or whatever? Okay, say this is 50, right? Say that it's two people a car, right? So we're talking 25 cars, right? But because it's going through this process, not the conditional use process, the only way for us to really get some understanding is to like, well, what would this really mean? Because this is really certain. It, events like this are surge traffic, right? So it's a, it's not sort of like trickled out. It's not even like a restaurant that's open for the entire evening. It's, it's, a, it's a specific, which I think is why it was identified as being different in the first place. Why, why theater, right? So and and having, you know, living in another, and having a home in another area that actually has a lot of this sort of use, um, it, it's very apparent. Like nothing happens most of the time, and boom, you get an impact. It's a very small window of the day, um, and then you have to vet like. Well, does that very small window in the day significantly impact the adjacent uses or not? Um, we can't do that analysis because we didn't, we're not going, we're not requiring that. And the only proxy for this would be for me to ask John, has the planning office staff been able to run scenarios based on assuming a generic 70 unit theater for one theater and then you would want to ask, like, well, presuming that since this is going to buy, it, it's only meaningful to do this by right in terms of knowing that you intend to have more than one, right? So, so then you'd have to actually ask, and it doesn't seem like we have in this town capacity to sort of say, let's circumvent, let's let's sort of have as a as a path forward circumventing conditional use permit processes and seeking out changing the rule. Because the only way to really analyze the impact of changing the rule is to ask professional staff to sort of do the lifting that the applicant would normally do. And um, I, John, you can comment on this, but I just don't think that's realistic that, that you have the capacity to sort of do this, to sort of act as if you're the applicant, which would be the only way that I think we could really analyze whether or not this or future ones are compatible with the RC. Um, Mr. Shaw, you have an, you know, you have, you, can you talk about capacity and sort of as we, if we sort of change, because I don't know how this would be any different than Dotson could have gone down the same road too, just to, you know, it's, it's a much easier lift to just circumvent 
conditional use applications in the RC. Um, and, and I don't want to. Well, I could just remind the commission, um, and most of you know this already, but there are already two other stages in the RC zone. Um, one of them is the outdoor, uh, the outdoor stage on Town Hill, which is on town property, but within the RC zone. The other one is a private outdoor stage at, at high tides. I'm not aware how this facility was permitted, but assuming it was permitted, but it does it doesn't have a trickle in effect. And these are performances that are done and they're they're, they're documented and available for everybody to consider. So so I guess the other part about that too is the limited geography we're talking about here. So it's not out of the realm of possibility to conceptualize the area that we're talking about is literally look out the window and see most of it right there <laughs> yeah. and, and sure. <laughs> just go through that conceptual exercise in this context. And that I, I would almost state that that's a luxury that we have because of the small size of our community that we can collectively go through that thought exercise without necessarily having to bring in hired consultants or, or take up a, a, a lot of staff time to be able to perform that at least cursory review of the thought exercise of what, what would the impact be of a 70 person show. So I, I, I'm looking for the distinction and how we understand what the neighbor's opinions are because right this isn't going through that process right we haven't notified them. We haven't said like you know we haven't gone through that at all. So that's because that's what's the, the theoretical concept that we could do that for this, but we couldn't do that for other CUP processes. Well, this is like, still subject to public hearing. We're still prior to this requirements. This is a motion just to, to to have the, uh, the the public hearing. Yeah, this is the motion to get that feedback. So it's certainly it's certainly is that I'm talking about the process of saying of saying we don't really want to be. We either have the vision without the information that's normally coming in through a CUP process to sort of yeah. green light things where we would say normally we don't have the vision. And we're like to say it's really just the same tiny rectangle down, right? So, how is this different? And then, how do we tell folks in the future, particularly with the optics of what you're talking about, to go like, well, wait a minute. So, you know, you just said like eliminate the rule of having to go through the review process. Oh, why why won't you eliminate it? and I don't understand how this is substantively different than other things that we ask for CUPs for in the RC. Not not generically for the town, right? But we're talking specifically about review for a congested area. So where and we don't have the other piece that's sort of missing at the moment is we don't if we if I even have the parking plan to look at, like the, the, that's that doesn't exist yet, right? So no, it does. Um, it's available. Like, well, I think you can. I mean, uh, the, the, the parking plan is as it's as it's in, in terms of the rule, but the parking plan in terms of where the stuff's going to go on the landscape, um, we're not there yet, right? In, in my understanding. Um, right, so it's kind of hard for me to sort of my crystal ball doesn't work. Right, is what it was what I'm saying. Um, so I, I, without I, I, without information coming in from both an applicant, but also just giving the courtesy to ask the neighbors. So that's what we're really talking about, not just for this one thing, but we're talking about eliminating that process. So I have a question that might help clarify. So because I don't know, let's let's put a what if line. Let's say this whole thing. We say, yes, let's take it to public hearing. It goes to public hearing. We say, hey, this is a great idea. Town council says, yeah, that's awesome. Let's do it. It gets approved, right? That's, so we're to that point. Right. So from that point forward in the future, right. um, if someone were to say, I got an idea. I want to put a 50 seat theater within the RC district. Um, and it's a buy right use so I can do that. Correct. Is there still a permitting process that that person has to go through in order to do that? The zoning permit, sure. Yeah, like okay. So there's so there's still a an approval process necessary in order for that to happen. Correct. It's, it's not just automatic. If they submit the application, it's going to happen. Uh, if it's at a use by right, just as long as 
everything within that district is adhered to in terms of performance standards, uh, bulk and area requirements, or a setback, and you know a number of other things. That would be something that would could be could, well because it, and that's of course obviously um, governed by other articles in the zoning district as far as parking is concerned. And this particular district, district, and I'm, I think you're aware of it, but I'm. I'm College, if I'm being redundant and saying what you already know, is that uh, specifically the parking, the, la the language in the parking ordinance as relates to the, the resort commercial zoning district contemplates uh, adhering to the off street parking requirement by uh, being able to park on the street within 500 feet of the location of the use. Okay, so because I, I, I think what you're getting at, Will, is, is potentially the possibility. For someone to just say, I only want to put 50 people in here, I'm putting in a theater, bam, it happens. And we've got no recourse, really. But it sounds like there still is amount, an amount of recourse because they still have to prove that they've met these gates in order for it to get approved. And if they can't meet those gates, it doesn't get approved. It's true. But ultimately, those gates are dictated specifically to allow the language that I just told you about and setbacks. And right, but they still have to prove that they've met those gates. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, there's no circumstance that somebody says, I am doing this because this is a use that has to be permitted in the zoning permitting process. And if there's something else associated with this, um, that should you know, potentially come out in the nature of uh, the application for the zoning permit and uh, uh, that uh, need to be submitted to our office. But it would be no different than uh, me saying that uh, a restaurant and somebody wants to put a restaurant right ne next door to the other, uh, another restaurant that is used by right. Have at it. And they don't have to apply for anything. They can just so go by right. Well, well, they have to apply for the zoning permit. It has to be approved. So does the theater that already existing, do they have to apply as well? Under this new text amendment, I, I don't know the, the the specifics about the, any reference to other theaters that are in the in the resort. Well, I'm talking about. I, I, I apologize for sounding self-serving, but the very reason we're discussing this is because uh, this particular theater wants to go by and book and do it right. Well, I, I understand that, and uh, and that's not necessarily the way things have been generally done in this town. And, and I appreciate that, Mr. Christensen, but I think what Mr. Christensen has done uh, in this exercise is point out uh, that there are some instances where uses are by right uses, and what he's proposing to do is materially not that much different from those uses that can be currently uh, identified as being uh, uses by right, bowling alley, skating rink. Uh, where they, they may be obviously potentially more adverse impact upon uh, so, the adjoining properties, but it's already there and identified as a use by right by the definition of commercial recreational uses. So basically, we're just we're adding an item to the by right list of items that already exist for that RC district. That correct. just happens to be that this particular item is um, a theater of less than 70 persons. Correct. Which apparently includes staff. Um, oh, correct. The, um, whereas if it were um, more than that, it would still be a CUP process. And that's correct. And so therefore, what is being addressed here is to identify a specific use that may have minimal impact as opposed to something where a number that exceeds that but now rises to the level that you would have to have a condition of use permit for that. And the, the underlying rationale is that because of the nature of, you know, more people being there, that now you crossed over to a point whereby this seems to be something now that some people would, or, or logic would dictate that there, that there may be more adverse impact because the nature of the use. impacts the area. Correct, ma'am. So, more, more so than the extent to what would be the use by right. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to get to your point of, um, somebody who wants to do something like this still needs to prove that the area can facilitate what they're trying to do, if for no other reason than having to show parking plan. Um, well, if, if, you're assuming they have the ability to have an off street parking, right? They can exactly. satisfy that requirement, as that made reference to, by pointing to that uh, parking is sufficient 
um, on street within 500 feet of, of the property. It, it, for all intents and purposes, it would be giving it an example. Uh, if you've, uh, uh, I don't know, let me give you an example. Go to Beale Street in Memphis. They've got restaurant upon restaurant, bar upon bar, right next to each other. They overlap. The, the parking area that's available overlaps for all of them. It's that's all the same. Space. Correct. Yeah. And there, of course, in some instances, and we haven't really delved into this to any great extent, uh, the possibility for additional surface parking, possibly, and other, uh, or structure, and, but that's to be determined. And then right. some of that is going to be a result of the parking study to, to give some insight into that, whether or not that's... Uh, My understanding is you're concerned with the abdication of the capability of uh, future enforcement by setting a precedent that basically relaxes the uh, control. It's, <laughs> it's, it's the inability to review for ad, adverse impacts, so it becomes a numbers game. So really, the parking thing just becomes a numerical thing. You're filling out a form, right? We just went through a CUP process. It was very involved, and we did it because Dodson had talked about putting what was it seven apartments in there, right? Was, so what is that like fourteen people, right? So and, well, plus the commercial use, right? Because it was mixed, right? But it was because, right, it was mixed. because they added a small number of residents, right? Because it would have gone through by right under commercial use. Absolutely. So we wanted to maintain, That's even correct. though there's a trivial amount of people by numbers, right, becoming that, we maintain that that still is appropriate to be reviewed because it's part of the RC, right? Because it's a different part of town. So this is what I get worried about with the slippery slope thing to go like, how do you say that impacts that are much smaller than this uh, will not be able to just say you should eliminate that part of the review in the RC. Um, so it's yeah, not all you know, the to, to, this to, edition of review of any use. It's the very specific list yeah. of uses. And, right. and so the dots and you, 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 you pick you a know. different RC required review category, right? right? That, that has a, a significant number of smaller entities that we're talking about in terms of potential adverse impact, particularly as it relates to adjacent uses. And to say we're going to maintain reviewing those, but we for that hypothetical, it. what what would that use be? Since what is your concern? Like there, there's got to be a specific use. Well, have. like I said, we just went through this, right? right. No, combined, no, the combined, I'm sorry. The combined, the combined, very the combined, very just the combined residential commercial mix piece, right? So that has a trigger of any level as long as it sort of starts to mix things, right? But you can, I think, you could easily say that. That's an arbitrary and bizarre thing to be looking at if you're going to allow by right things that already were in conditional use to, to, to become by right things. Because I'm, I'm, it, it just seems yeah. like we're setting up. But a I, I think, I think we'll um, sort of come it up initially with the request uh, to I, change the code. I think we're looking at that different fails, things, though. Sort of mm -hmm. uh, in the, as opposed to the normal order of things, which is to say, why not just go through the regular like why why not just go through the regular review and if it's a benign thing that folks are agreeable on then it gets approved uh, i think to compare it with dodson and the uh, mixed use commercial residential on the boardwalk is kind of not a comparing apples to apples um and so I, the impact is going to be very different as a result of that um it Thoughts on the development of about two restaurants plus what, 12 different res, res, uh, 11? I mean, uh, yeah, and, and, nine. And, and nine. There, there's no parking there. I mean, but, it, 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 but that's if there was, a, if there was, if there was any kind of a, a lesson to take from that, is that the town feels that it can absorb that much kind of parking. I, we've done a parking survey, we've done taken them in the available street and 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 within 50, within 500 feet uh you know spaces around and we, it's easy to do 70 feet please wait oh, i was just going to say with respect to the conditional use process i understand the, de the desire to um evaluate impact um but just um on the flip side of that or devil's advocate or I don't know, philosophical um, point, um, it does have a chilling effect on economic development. And I know one of the town's goals is economic development. So I think um, one thing that Mr. Um, Shaw was touching on was that um, if there are uses that are that that do have nominal impact, especially with vis-a-vis uh, -vis other by right uses, um, and that could uh, encourage economic development and open up 
for business in a way. Um, see, the CEP process does have a chilling effect on economic development. So just so for for consideration of anything that may come come before you. Right, to, 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 to kind of put this, thank you very much. That's very educational. I appreciate that. Uh, I think to put this in kind of a um, slightly more of an apples to apples situation. We're dealing with, um, so the proposed addition is theaters with a maximum permitted occupancy of no more than 70 persons to the buy right. And to the conditional use, theaters with a maximum permitted occupancy of more than, what are we, what are we going to say? More than 70 persons? Yes. Right? 71 or more? Over 70. So to kind of put that in apples, apples to apples comparison to what we already have in a situation like that, right? Um, so small theater versus bigger theater. Um, we have uh, number four on the permitted use list is brew pubs, and number five on the conditional use list is micro breweries. Right. Um, now, to me, as a what would be I think considered a layperson, I don't know the difference in those. However, there is a codified here. Right. There's a codified difference between what a brew pub and what a microbrewery is. Correct. And clearly one would think, since it's in the CUP section, right. that a microbrewery is an expectation of a larger number of persons. Um right at a particular time, whether it's because it has to have a restaurant type of thing associated with it, something to that effect. Generally, those would be open more in the evening, I would think. Yes. Um, so there is also the same type of more of a uh, pinpointed effect of impact. Right. Um, so we're already doing that for a <laughs> type of establishment that, that has the same kind of effect. Brew pub versus micro group. So small theater versus larger theater. Uh, I don't... So, and I get what you're saying. You don't want to throw out all of the possible review process for future potential versions of this. When and you're not just a, talking yeah. about theaters. You're, you're talking right. about setting a precedence for things going down the road. Yeah, yeah. And the next entity comes and, in and says, I'm saying, saying an analogous right. process. And I'm saying we want to set that precedent by defining the difference between brew pub as a buy right and microbrewery as a CUP. We've already said we can do this kind of a thing for a small, you know, a limited number of persons establishment, right? That's going to be a limited time impact thing versus a larger version of the same kind of establishment um, that's going to be a limited time impact thing. So the only difference is one is a, a theater is going to have these people in it for two hours versus a brew pub is going to have people in it heavily for four or five hours, maybe. So, so I'd like to see the list of the history, but I think the distinction to me is that when they wrote the code, right, did these end up in different categories because there was an effort to sort of essentially go around the CUP process, right? Is that how they ended up by right? I, I and that would be the only way that I would believe it's sort of analogous. Because we have, what I'm saying is we have a friendly, we very straightforward process to sort of deal with this already. Right, right? But that, that's my confusion. I can tell you why brew pubs ended up where it ended up. Because somebody wanted to put in a brewery and we knew breweries attracted tourism and we wanted to make it easy to do that so that they would put it in and attract tourism. So that's exactly why yeah. that happened because I was here. I wasn't involved in any of this process, but I was here before that happened and I know what they had to go through in order to do that. And the town even had to codify allowing a brewery in the town at all. It wasn't even allowed in the town, I think, if I remember correctly. That's probably true. So we had to change a lot in order to facilitate even having that kind of business in town and specify the size that we wanted to make um, by right. But that's not a good analogy because that didn't I think have it's a, a process analogy. they could have gone through your second. Yeah, it was actually the CUP, submitted process. Well, they, in the process of the CUP, they also had to get the town to change the code to allow a brewery in the town. Okay. Theaters, for one reason or another, weren't even listed. That there weren't on here. So it's not that we're saying now we should allow. Hey guys, to, oh, we got to, 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 to wind this down. Yeah. 
So uh, I think we've already set the precedent. Okay. Right, I'm like 30 so seconds from like leaving this group completely. Mm -hmm. So if you want to keep me here, not that anyone wants to, we have to go. And it's hard on circles. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, usually in other bodies I've been a part of, the way you end this is somebody puts forward the motion to do something and second it vote on, right? That's not, I that's would like to put it. forward a motion to approve the um, proposal as written. I, I thought we were going to have a hearing. We have well, yes, a so public hearing. But you, make, so, you have to make a motion to get to that point. Make a motion to have a hearing to. I'll second it. <laughs> Seven. All right. So everybody agrees. Seventy persons. Yes. 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 So uh, seventy. No more than seventy persons in a theater, including no more than seventy persons in the permitted uses, right. and then uh, in conditional uses, theaters with the maximum permit, permitted occupancy of more than seventy persons. And we're going to put that forth for public hearing <laughs> on the June thirtieth. Uh, meeting of the planning commission. Yes. Is that a motion? Can you, so can you just, just to clarify, just no, I'm not in agreement. So can you just say majority rule, majority okay. said blah, 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 you know? Okay. We'll, 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 we'll yeah, do take a roll call. Yeah. So can I get a motion? Yes. So moved. All right. Second. Second. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Knuckles, would you yeah, support or right. yeah, yeah, your name the, the motion? No, okay. No, no. Name. Okay. Mr. Christensen. He's are you, you know, he's here. Here. No. Yes. Yeah. Aye. 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 So the motion passes. Um, so we will go ahead and add uh, to the June 30th meeting a public hearing notice uh, for the uh, amendment as proposed. All right. All right. Moving right along. Um, you, you do realize that. Forty five minutes ago, that's where I started off with. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. So uh, on to <laughs> item seven, committee reports. Just saying. Um, let, let's go with the housing committee update on yes. short term leave. Yes. yes. Uh, what, what do you have to share on short term like, rental? Period? Yeah. So I, yeah, I emailed this out earlier. I was late. I apologize about that. Um, travel last week. So. Uh, Vicky did a or Ms. Linda did a great job of kind of putting it on paper, uh, just from research that we've done other cities, both in Virginia and other states. Um, I leaned on uh, Ms. Linda again because I'm a terrible writer, so um, so she's got it together for everyone to look at. And when we talked last month, it was like, hey, let's get something up on the board and start talking about. It. So I threw some discussion points out there. So I don't know if we want to just go through those or we, how you want to, you know, just I kind of, know. yeah. So, I mean, you know, look, the simplest one, you know, we put oops, sorry, uh, the dates, right? I mean, I don't know and some of the, for the town staff is, is a July to July, July one to July one good timing for town. I, I have no idea. Um, can you, maybe that's something you would know more about too. I don't know well, what uh, other things are coming into the town then or, or I wrote sure that, that that way because that's when, um, you know, our fiscal year starts. And uh, I just wanted to, you know, have a coordinate with that. So so my only question on that actually goes into the, actually the first three questions are all tied together. Um, so question one would be, when are businesses required to have business licenses renewed within the town, right? So that would need to be in because number two, what is it? Usually that's May first. May first. Okay. Um, I'm not mistaken. I think it was April, and now it's May. I yeah, think right. that's right. So, so to skip to number to discussion point number three, A B, the registration fee, specifically the registration fee portion of it. Um, I asked a a deep deep poll of exactly one person um, <laughs> their opinion on this, and um, and it was. Um, the fines for not doing it, $500, bang on, not Good. an issue. Phew. The $200 registration fee, problem. And the problem is this. Um, one, the town is shorting itself. Two, um, the town is kind of inherently over feeing, if you will, um, this particular type of business. 
if you make them get a business license for short-term rentals, right? They're required to do that now. Right. Then it well, it, then we enforce it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you automatically get a registration of who has short-term rentals, right? And if you make them listed in their business license for short-term rentals, all of their properties associated with it, you have a listing of all of the short-term rental properties plus. The fee for a business license is based on your gross receipts, or if you have, if this is your first year, your proposed gross receipts for the year, which right. comes out to exceedingly more than two hundred dollars. So um, you're so you're getting a business license. You're paying the fee for the business license, which is more than two hundred dollars, um, because of what your gross receipts are expected to be. Um, and you're automatically getting a list of who has short-term rentals and where they are. So you kind of kill those three birds with one stone just by enforcing the business license portion of it. Um, now, the downside of it is uh, how do you how do you enforce if somebody's not getting their business license? I don't know. I don't know who's doing the research to search all of the the things to say, we have this many in town and this who owns them and they're clearly not registered. But I do understand that once we codify this and we can give it to the Airbnbs and VRBOs, et cetera, that they will automatically remit the appropriate taxes to the town. You end up with an automatic tattletale system. If somebody's not registered in the town and the taxes get paid to the town, you get an automatic, well, wait a minute. Why are we getting taxes from this property when this property isn't listed by us through a business license as being in the town. So you, you solve a lot of problems in that, I think. It's just... Well, I, I hear what you're saying. The idea is to simplify things and, and we definitely want to do that. But the <laughs> registry that uh, we were looking at uh, allows for the collection of more information about that applicant um, than the business license would um, you know, involve. And um, they, there's already a lodging tax that goes along with short-term rentals, um, but the application will allow us to help uh, build towards uh, adding staff or, um, you know, allowing for code enforcement to come in uh, and, and it sort of offset the cost of, of doing that. So um, I, I kind of understand that, but I think the additional fee at $200 to to make people register, they're already not getting a business license. It's certainly not going right. to. This would going back in time when you know Mr. Cabry would sit there, and, and you guys talked about that business license. I, I didn't even. I thought there was a big complaint about you. It, you couldn't even fill it out. Is if your business was a short term rental person? Right. It's, it's not your business license. You can't fill out. That's very doable. Um, I mean, I look at it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, it's the, the tax fee. Well, yeah, yeah it's that's, really that's, We haven't gotten to that part yet, but I thought they were both bad. Uh, and the, the <laughs> they were both the work, maybe. That's a good way to put it. I didn't hear complaints about the, the licensing process. So, um, it, to be 100% with you for doing the business license in town, I'm not the one who did that. I did the state registration to get a business license mm -hmm. and a number, et cetera. Uh, which, by the way, took about a half an hour. It was you know, really easy. Right. Um, so, but I do know, and I've filled out the form. The man, the the tax form for paying your taxes is not simple, and unless it's been updated, I don't know. I haven't seen yeah. it lately. It, it didn't even it this list year. lodging. You had to scratch out meals and write lodging on it. Yeah, and then you had to do some crazy proration of pro taxes. Yeah. Thing. I am going to pay it on time. You're not going to pay it on time. I know all this weird stuff. Now, if you can do it online, um, you can pay it online. Maybe it's a lot simpler now. I don't know. I know we've improved our online thing. I'm just saying what I've what I've heard is the the fee, the registration fee sounds excessive. Well, you know, um, I think the registration concept in general um, to have a registration. I think that's great. All right. So before we get into the evolution of this, it is not our place to administer this. That is the county staff. So 
deciding on quantities and fees, that there should be a registration fee is absolutely a valid recommendation on our part. How much it should be is completely up to staff. That's that's my so but but I guess I'm trying to say I don't think there should be a registration fee. I think adding a registration form or process to the business license if you have a adding it to the business, process, right? That makes a lot of sense. I think that is brilliant. I think right. that's great, but I think adding because there's a lot of data you have to collect there. Yeah. Right. It's more than it's on that business license. It's so it, it could be a supplemental. Absolutely. That, I think that's where Tree's going. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. That well, makes a lot of sense. It felt like the fee was a penalty. No, it, 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 no, and we don't like. We, right, you know, I know it attorney said that. Right, it exactly. It seemed like a fee, and the additional fee because you're having a short term rental versus uh, a food truck or some other business in <laughs> town. Sam yep. Sam gave the sense of a penalty, and, and that, that wasn't the intention. So, so I hear you, Brett. Hey, may I comment on this? Sure. Yeah. The planning commission is not the final arbiter of this. It's the town council. Right. So, so, so if, if you pick a number, I mean, and you think that's uh, too much, it's onerous, pick a lower number. And, and it's now the prerogative of the town council to make that number higher or lower, or yeah. the number that you agree you, that you think is appropriate. Agreed. Right. Yeah, Agreed. but I, to me, it's not even so much the number is the yeah. tree's idea of, hey, yeah. you have to do this yeah. business license anyway, let's have this set down, like you said. As part of it, since it's short term, because there are data points that we need to collect yeah. 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 beyond yeah. the food truck, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. 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 there's a lot more data points. Yeah. And, and I think also the registry of, of the units, whether you know there's a fee or not, um, will um, I sort of uh, put us in a situation where we're expressing to that buyer, owner, uh, operator that we're not liable because of any failure that they have operating the units to meet code requirements. Okay. That's my concern, is liability as well. All right, so, and, that, and that'll be, I assume, part of the questionnaire that will be determined by staff and, and the liability. So we'll, from a planning commission and code and occupancy and use and compatibility of use perspective, what you've got up at the top is a, it's kind of what the focus was that we definitely we need to have these definitions to be able to enable these other recommendations of let's have a parallel process for registration so that it enables the, the auditing and accountability piece. Uh, we're really tasked with this. Uh, what do we need to adopt code wise as far as definitions and uh, evaluations of compatibility of use or, or evaluations of do we need to add additional language to the code to specifically address the uses of the short term rentals, for example? Um, the like you've got in section E here about quiet hours and parking and maximum street spaces. So the, those are the two areas that I think that we really need to dial in on, you know, not necessarily yeah, well, uh, administration of uh, licensing, because that, that is way beyond the purview of the planning commission. So we want to focus on what are the right definitions to put into the code to validate. Well, I, I hear what you're saying. And, uh, you know, uh, what I did is uh, all the uh, the comparisons and, and uh, ordinances and registry um, that Mr. Shaw provided to us, I sort of gathered that all together and tried to synthesize it. So that's okay. where that, that information came from what we were provided. Okay. Um, so so in, in the form of looking at the process and, and how do we move this forward, we need to be able to say at some point our deliverables are going to be additional <laughs> definitions or clarification definitions right. for the code and then any additions to the code that we feel relevant to this and should and then we have to determine whether or not uh, we want to put them in the individual uh, code sections like R, you know, the R, anything with an R in it, um, or, or do we need to put it somewhere else where it can be referenced? Or town wide. Yes. Yeah. So, and, and that's that's where we would defer to, you know, best location for that. I have, I have a question. If, um, so from the fee discussion, um, is the, goal to impose some sort of fee that, that's what our implicit understanding is from staff and the, council the so, reason i'm asking that question is because if the goal is to simply gather the additional information that would come to a registry that could be added to the business license tax for that 
type of thing. That's, that's what exactly yeah. I was talking about. Yeah. yeah. Well, then, then you wouldn't have a registry at all. It would. It would. You would need a separate. Board right. To be right. So, and, and I think can, that's what we were pointing. Put it, it as part of the recommendation to the council. Formation of a registry with information uh, above and beyond uh, standard business licensing requirements as part of that recommendation. That if we so choose to adopt that and pass that forward, does that make sense? One of the things that um, I uh, reviewed was that there are problems with jurisdictions where there are uh, nuisances uh, that exist in short-term rentals where the local jurisdiction has no authority to address it beyond calling the police out for uh, noise uh, issues and, and that sort of thing. And so this would give us an ability if we were to require or, or inform the owner operator that there it should a violation occur a fire a situation like that that we can at least have our code inspector go in and and uh, evaluate it for, so for okay. fires for, but that that yeah. is not That's, added by the registry no. uh, at all that no, no. no i think she's talking farther down when they started to talk about like the um um Right to inspect, yeah, reserves the right to disavow registry of a short term rental code, uh, if for short term rental for a code enforcement violation, um, or has occupants that have been given one or more citations by the police department for noise or any other violation. Um, that last part of that, um, I have an issue with that because as a tenant, I mean, as an owner. Mm -hmm. If I have a bad tenant, um, I can, let's say I'm renting through Airbnb, renting mm -hmm. the property out through Airbnb. If I have a bad tenant, I can I contact Airbnb and Airbnb has the right to tell them to leave and, and they are gone. And then you can restrict that person from ever coming back. Pun punishing, now, if an okay. owner has repeated sedition, instances of violations i can see where you're getting into something yeah but, um for a one time a one-off yeah a one-off where i and you had you have here um one or more citations well we can change that right i'm just saying that yes yeah. we need to look at that and we need to maybe modify yeah. that a little and, bit. and and you know not all of them are uh airbnb right. where they some of have the ability to right. address a nuisance right problem um, so I'm not saying yeah. take it out. I'm just saying we probably don't. Yeah, I hear you. Mm -hmm. So, Thank so you. in order to really kind of put this to the point where we can say, all right, all right the next step for adoption and any changes in the ordinance would be, okay, we have the proposed the verbiage that we want to and where we want to insert that. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what we need to kind of distill some of this up. Well, and well, we can start with the definitions, problem. right? Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, but as far as the, the following information and, and looking at um, now, what exactly, you know, what, defining that good neighbor policy in terms of code and compatibility of uses, um, that's, that's where we need to focus on as far as administration and uh, dollar signs and stuff like that. That can be a subsection of a recommendation to council, but for public hearing purposes, um, we just need to focus on the section of code that we want to change and what we want to specifically adopt in that. I think it's important for the, to convey to the public as we're going down this road what the goal is for this process. So I've seen this in other communities. Part of the goal is people get upset about things that are happening that should already be being addressed by government. And they're failing to, and they're failing to either sometimes by collect, more often times it's because of resources, like there just isn't enough co-compliance, inspectors, police, right, those sorts of things, and there are people sort of grabbing at straws, often in the political forum, saying, I will fix your problems by sort of creating a parallel process that doesn't actually ever fix the underlying problem of staffing, right? So, you know, so that, that's one thing, right, is, is the appearance of a solution um, that doesn't actually solve something, right? That that's the concern of mine. And and is that really what we're hoping to say is that we will be able to fix the dysfunctional parts of town and county government by coming up with a short-term rental policy that's sort of like we can control, right? Because they're not 
do in that part, right? I mean, that may be valid, right? Or maybe invalid, but I'm saying I think it's important to tell people why we're going on this road. That, that's a piece of this, right? The other one is like, well, people should just be um, doing what they're supposed to um, with the question about like registering for businesses, right? And it's, I think it's reasonable for us to convey to the administration to say, hey, we wish you were looking at this more carefully because it could have rippling effects you might not have thought of. But that's not really a new thing. That's just, we sort of ask them to look more closely. Oh, and then the other end of the spectrum is to say, no, we're going down this road because it is ultimately our recommendation that we restrict this. Oh, and I think you should be clear about that because I think that's going to change the way you sort of go down the process. If you say the goal is restriction, um, then you're going to have a kind of a different path, right? And then you're going to have to start figuring out, well, how do you achieve restriction? Part of this is by going to think like you got to change the category, which means you got to change the definition. But if you're not actually talking about really wanting to put in new restrictions, um, this is a time suck that doesn't need to happen. Right. So I, I just think it's clear about like where you want to go and why you want to go there so that both, I mean, we can have a better dialogue, but also the public can give us more meaningful input. Um, once, you know, the question is, are we asking them, is it a good idea to restrict or not restrict? Or is it saying, hey, we plan on restricting, we would like your advice on how to get there. Right? So, and I think those are very different sort of public forum discussions depending on how we. I don't understand, or to be honest, I don't understand which one of those were dictated. I, and I, I think what was the point of that, and I think the question then becomes for town council, what is the intent? Do we plan on limiting the number of short-term rentals that the town allows? And if so, then a registry feeds into that because we get a number, we can eventually deny business license and additional business licenses for more, we've reached our maximum number, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that puts us in a, in a category, right? So we know where we're going. Yeah. With it. Um, so I think that's a very valid question is what is our or, or you mentioned where you could say very much what you were going with originally with the registration part, but like I was gonna say, okay, it's Allison would like to wait. It's, it's already it's, it's already happening. We just want our money, right? The existing right. processes, right? So I think part of this is we want the registration to understand the amount of short-term um, housing that we have for rentals, right? So that way there at some future point, there may be a determination that you only want to have hundred, I'm using round numbers here, just you only want to utilize 100 to allow for a certain percentage of housing in Colony Beach to be used for Airbnb, to evaluate that, to make sure that you have the efficient workforce housing or just single family homes and that kind of stuff. So essentially if everybody on the point bought a house and they turned it into an Airbnb, how would that best serve Colony Beach? That's part of the town council's uh, problem space to make sure we understand because right now we don't know how many Airbnbs we have or VRBOs or whatever that kind of stuff. So it, the registry of those would um, help identify those. The business licenses would help identify those. And once we get the information, staff can make re recommendations on you know what's best for the town in terms of how many of these are we um, utilizing for the public, right? So that, that's kind of the, the step process and I hope that answers your question. Yeah. So Kenny, I was gonna say that um, one of the things that we were able to do is uh, utilize some software to do a sweep of all of the advertisements for short-term rentals. And about uh, nine months ago or so, we came out with an actual number of 124 units, um, but that's changed. I mean, it's always fluid. What I, um, what I have learned in this process of discussing um, the possibility of looking at an ordinance is that we're not ready yet. Our community is not ready yet to put a number of, you know, and to limit the number. But the registry and, and collecting that data about who has the units, how many units do they have, um, that is important. And so eventually, maybe we'll get to a point where we can look at restrictions if we need to. So our current intent is strictly Data. Registration and data. And definitions. Right, definitions, yeah. which allows us to get through registration and data gathering. Yeah. Because um, yeah. your number of short-term um, rentals throughout the year will flex even, you have, Monthly. let's say you have 100 businesses that are doing short-term rentals, whether they have 
whether it's 100 ten, uh, homes or not. Over the course of the year, during the winter time, the number of short-term rentals that are actually being used as short-term rentals is going to drop significantly because of dog rent, because people rent for three to six months to dog rent people. Um, and then during the season, it's going to awesome. balloon, and then it's going to drop again. So, so your short-term rental numbers are really going to do a lot of this throughout the year. But I think still having a registration of ones that are intended for that use. Right. Did we find in the in the existing code sort of a proxy for the tourist yeah. tour panel that already existed? Oh, that was the traveling house. And tourist it was tourist, 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 tourist. That's what I do. So can we, even before we move on this, can we encourage the folks that deal with business registrations to, you provided the OLS data about who theoretically is operating a business, mm -hmm. and they can use that definition, right, to say, are you registering your business? It, it doesn't, it, it, right? Like what, we need to, we have to do the definitions for clarification purposes because that one that you're referencing doesn't encompass and, and exclude some of the activities we're specifically trying to collect information on. So, at the very first step, uh, you just codify kind of short term. Yeah, yes. right, right. So, we're we getting fine. rid of that. And replacing it with this. No, no, no. Keep no. that. Yeah. Keep that. And we're going to add uh, something that's an approximation and, and likely a verbatim uh, yeah. adoption of whatever the Virginia code yeah. is. Yeah, I believe I took this from the code. Okay. To yeah. define short term. I should write it. So to define the short term. And <laughs> so then at that point, we can say, okay, now that we have a short term, it was defined. That, that yeah. will enable the creation of that data gathering mechanism. So it, it's not an equivalent also between the definition of term and correct. Term. So so if we really want to narrow next steps, we, we need to focus on definitions. So can we present it to the council that way? First start with this is the definition of short term rental for the town of Colonial Beach. Our suggested definition of short term rental for Colonial Beach because we have that and I think yep. we all agree on that most likely. So yeah. we could present that now. Yeah. We could say, yeah. this is our suggestion so, to do that. And I don't know that that even needs, does that even need a public hearing? If it's no, going to be adopted in the code. It's a text amendment because you're adding something that's not okay. identified in the mm -hmm. ordinance now. That's so, yeah. so, okay, but we're ready for that. Okay. We could, we could present that and- Would you like to make a motion to that effect? I would like to make a, mo like to make a motion that we present to town council the definitions as stated for addition to town code. For short term rentals. I'll give someone else the benefit. I'll second. Of that. Okay. The, just a close to clarification. I get the first three, but the short term rental registry, did, did we, if, if we're in agreement that we can't use the business license process and we hate to have a parallel process, I've been agreeing with this language. But if we're not quite there yet, on I think the registry can still the, happen the, with the business license process. It's just an added an addendum that's added to the license. Like if you're getting a, a restaurant, you have different forms to fill out to show that uh, you're uh, right. You could say must provide an account, and the mechanism for that is, is the addition on your yes. it on your business license. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. May so, I have weigh in on this one? Sure. Absolutely. If you're going to make the motion, then you're going to say we're defining this. Uh, use and you're just going to use the Code of Virginia's definition of what constitutes a short term rental. Yes. Where is it applicable? Identify the zoning districts so where this applies, please. Okay. So, in definitions, uh, under definitions for all our zones, right? Is it all our zones or is it RC? I mean, does somebody so, who has a condo? So, okay. So, so, I guess the specificity would be all zones that include residential units however if we have the business uh, license and the registry combined don't we need a code uh, an ordinance for that um so that combining definitions with the registry uh in in the code is effectively right now we're just at definition okay we're defining what um because here it's just a definition. So we're not just here. Going to say an order that says May I? we're just at definitions at this point. I think yes, yes. Uh, if this is going to be um, tied to the business license process, 
Is this go going in the zoning ordinance at all, or are you recommending that it go in what in the same section with the business licenses? Because if that's where it's going to live, it is the council can take care of it. So it would, yeah, the and we don't need why it. we want to add it to the zoning definitions is so that the next step will be uh, the limitations or compatible use evaluation for nuisance essentially, and, and that's my intention there. But you are correct as far as administration of business licensing the, the, I'm talking about the registration part right. yeah. um my gut based on what I'm hearing from you is that that should live in a different chapter altogether and so you can punt <laughs> that part, <laughs> That's what I'm that part. Okay. um and and, yes. and with respect to the definition if I may you're going to tie to state code given the fact that state code does um change from time to time um, I like referencing, I just like saying it shall be defined as in Virginia Code section 15.2-983 right. as amended from, as, as from time to time amended. And that way you don't it when if it changes there, it changes in yours automatically. Okay. Okay. It, I'm, I'm inclined that it, it is okay for me to weigh in on this. Please. To retain uh, what we, the conversation we've had thus far about defining this and, and defining it in the zoning ordinance uh, because now you uh, specify this and historically or historically traditionally this is something that is codified in the zoning ordinance as a, as a use uh, because now you've defined the use and, you, and so that that traditionally of course has been where for one of a better term is parked I mean, it's, it's placed and now you uh, establish in those areas where there are uh, dwelling units and where dwelling units are permitted whether it be single family dwellings or other types of dwellings this something would be permissible to do that so you've satisfied the part of it where there actually is a use it's identified now it's enumerated you, you know you, you you have identified this is something that's permissible to do this in the zoning district so one is that the other component piece of it if you don't from my perspective have it in the zoning ordinance of course um and that's certainly the prerogative of the town council to do that uh you, you for all intents and purposes uh make it a, a circumstance now that you have to come back to the drawing board and talk about all these types of things that potentially are the impacts of this use in the zoning district and how do you address those impacts and the common ones that worry about the impacts of what this does is it, it provide it, the issues historically have been overcrowding of housing is one uh, it, it's parking issues because people are not to have sufficient area to have off street parking so that's a parking issue the other identified issue is it, it traditionally has been we need to identify for purposes of notifying um uh, police, fire, uh, and of course, initial emergency services, and uh, for purposes of any other type of emergency, to, to identify that a phone number and a name of a contact uh, in case there is a problem, but somebody is actually renting a house for a period of time to uh, do that. And so, it, in essence, it, it, it really kind of distilled, distilled down to four things, you know, overcrowding, parking, uh, notice, uh, you know, to make people aware for purposes uh you know, where there may be a potential problem and the only other one that i can think of off uh hand that the historical traditionally is used is you know not much more than that i think it's it's, it's primarily what the, if you would distill all of these down and there are a number of them obviously uh, throughout the commonwealth of virginia uh, that they, they they pretty much turn on that and the only other thing that you say as part of the uh, the registry for the zoning ordinance would be shall obtain business license from the town. Now I'm so. In the in the point so, the point I'm making uh, also that is attended with this is, in both Mr. Mr. Howell and Mr. Knuckles and all and I think the rest of you alluded to this also. We have limited staff to administer this thing. So if you get if you if you go down a path we and. and Basically, for one of the term, heap on more requirements for purposes of enforcement, it becomes problematic. Yeah. And the point is, uh, you uh, set up something that's basically, uh, you know, if, if you set it up for failure. Yeah. So, 
So if I can understand um, that you're saying that uh, an ordinance that would address occupancy standards, uh, parking, um, the registry, right. uh, definitions, right. those four things are what's needed from an ordinance. I think for the most part, if you're talking about something that uh, you know, it, it basically satisfies what I hear to be uh, the interest in doing this at this juncture. Uh, you, you know, any ordinance that relates to a zoning ordinance, it's not the Ten Commandments. It's not written in stone. It can be it, it can be changed at another future point in time. I, I, and I I hear where you're going. I think we're not even quite at that point yet. I That's think fine. We're just at the adding the definitions point. And that's fine. All right. As you're talking well, about adding definitions and you're talking about the presidential, so that's kind of a brainer, but how do you deal with non conforming use in areas that, like, we have, like, just legacy stuff, right? We have, we've got stuff that we've allowed, but we also just have enough legacy things in town. Uh, how do we deal with those? Like, why wouldn't we just say it applies to the town? Why would we that's a good question? I mean, there's boats that people rent short term rentals, and they're floating on water, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's true. What's yeah. the advantage of restricting it to just one category? That was just uh, uh, um, the effort is to narrow the scope enough to make it so that it is it would we can make something actionable or point taken, absolutely. So then the Follow up conversation would be uh, one: What is the specific codes, or specific section in the Code of Virginia are we referencing for the definitions? Two: uh, if, if that's what we're looking at, where is the best place in the ordinances for this to reside? Right. And I would have to defer to staff on that. Right. Uh, right. So. That's I, I that's I guess I, that's the we that we're, we're at, we're at um, but that's what we have yeah. to adopt or, or make the recommendation to adopt is an ordinance so that would essentially what I'm getting at is we're going to have to uh, allow some folks to do some homework to be yeah. able to come back next month and say okay this is the specific references to the code this is the specific section we would like to put this in for, for definitions and applicability. And then uh, I think that we've got something that's actionable that will move things forward in a meaningful way so that we can make a recommendation to council for, you know, hypothetically setting up a, a hearing, public hearing in July so that we can express that intent publicly that we are uh, putting this stuff into the code so that we can gather information for future policy decisions as our intent explicitly stated and we can learn the impact and then yeah. we will be able to make that uh in action for us to, to move forward and then once we've adopted that uh, respectively i guess the july meeting then we can get additional feedback from council once they've had an opportunity to review and get additional information on what else uh they need help with for us to be able to dig into as far as um, adjacent uses and uh, those nuisance clauses for um, kind of part. Is that use. something you think that is possible for staff to help create that document? Yes. Okay. There you go. Yes, I, I, I do. That's and, very helpful. Yes. Thank you. And, and, okay. and to Mr. Knuckles' point, that's a violation of the code violation of being on a boat because it's short term rental. It assumes it's a dwelling unit. A boat is not a dwelling unit. <laughs> so that may be something that. Because Later on, down the road. circumstances. <laughs> well, but, but you don't, the zoning ordinance doesn't govern boats. That's personal. That's right. You are it's, correct. It has to do with land. And, and it's technically in the water. So it's right. Yeah. Do, do we need to do anything affirmative with the idea about having town council go ahead and make these definitions that they make reference? We just do this conversationally and say, Mr. Alice, can you carry forth that request that that? Be considered to be an agenda item for the town council. So part of we this, have to formally. So part of this is that. So yes, the reason why we have to formally pass something and the part of the process that we have to go through with this is largely due to the fact that we are a conduit for public opinion and information and feedback. So no, I'm talking stuff that, that's outside of our lane. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. That, that Mr. Board. Allison's taking notes and will be happy to provide his uh, planning commission update. Or is you know, next council meeting? Yeah, that's the important next. Uh, Vivian has a question. I, I was just going to clarify. So, yes, with respect to like definitions, for example, in chapter 20 of the zoning ordinance, but not 
the rest of the code. If it's if that's why I was saying if your registration is going to reside in another part of the code, you don't have to have the public hearings and make recommendations on all that kind of thing. So right. that that was the only reason I brought that up before was kind of to what you're yes the point that you're making now, which is so yes, if it's in chapter 20, which Mr. Shaw correctly pointed out, some of those definitions should be because you have other goals and objectives as well. But with respect to the registration, possibly no. Uh, yes, correct. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Just a paraphrase. So they can, without yes. public discussion, just move forward and tweak that, and then no, that would no. they no. would have to have a public hearing. But but on zoning yeah. on, on zoning ordinance amendments, you have to, and then they have to. Yeah. It's done. It, twice because it's done so because they have to have a recommendation from you after a public hearing. But if it's not in the zoning ordinance, then they only the town council. Definitions in regard to the business licensing component that requires them to have a public hearing. Yes. Any text amendment. Yeah, right? thank well, you. Yeah. Okay. Resiliency committee update. Uh, we met again, Vivi and I were, were present. We have a, a new member that's going to end, and he was by your invitation. So, if you could, uh, uh, well, up. we have uh, a resident that lives on Lincoln, um, and that's in an area with the north side of the beach that's highly impacted by flooding. And uh, uh, very active was a former uh, town council member and uh, has a lot of background in terms of you know their legislative work that they've done and so we're delighted to have them um and we're seeking a lot uh opportunities for to adding new people to the um, committee yeah, and we're going to continue those outreach efforts uh, outside of that we also have some uh uh Dr. So sullivan is also interested in this portfolio and she's been uh pursuing some of the same things we have in terms of monitoring outside groups and she's interested in uh, having some part of the town uh, engage with the PDC to talk about whether we can work together regionally. I think the question back to the PDC was, you know, who could who could be the town rep on that? I don't think there's been an answer to that yet, but so I don't know if that's a, yeah, that's it's an example of sort of a snapping question if that was a question about whether huh. that's the residence committee or the town council. Okay. I, they asked the question, but I don't think we have a good answer. answer. Yeah. Reason uh, what's inter yeah. broad interest, I think, is nothing but good. And the fact that this is touching several parts of the town. That's really possible. Uh, that was kind of an expectation. Yeah. Um, is there any other topics that we need to? Uh, I don't know. We're still late, some members, right? So, a member, a yes. member right? We, so, right. is what are we are we doing anything with recruitment or? Uh, or is it just everybody ask him what you talk to him? Yeah, spread the word. The word. And I have been. Um, yes. You know, we've been. And, and, and Steve, I also yeah. mentioned it in the last town council meeting. Yeah. Um, so for anybody who wanted to put an uh, application in uh, during our um, information briefs, you know, right, right. the planning commission, yeah. like that. So uh, yeah. it was publicly notified, you know, through the town council as well. Is that uh, any way that maybe a little blurb could be put on the website? I'll talk to the uh, town manager about that. And all of the newsletter. The uh, quarterly uh, uh, newsletter that goes out with the, the water bill. Um, I, I just have a, an administrative question. Uh, can we get a copy of this uh, meeting? Uh, okay. How do we how do we go about getting a copy of it? I will probably post it on YouTube if I did record. Okay. Great. Nice. So Excellent. Because nice, you know, I know we're all wiped out, and you know, I just want to be able to, you know, go back over it and say, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, with that, uh, have no other topics. We're going to adjourn this evening's meeting. Thank you. Thank you.